They handcuffed me and my wife out here. They wanted me to sit on the curb uh, while they were carrying this out, uh, something that I refused to do. They wanted my wife to sit on the curb out here that she refused to do. As I was coming out, this big old drone met me. The only revolutionary organization that's done something here on the ground practically for African people is the one that's come under attack. Institution that offers a community radio station, a newspaper, a commercial kitchen, a, an Aquabo Hall rental space, and community office for our organizers. That was the building that has come under attack. You need a breach? What do you need? Uh, uh, need one. I don't know. Oh, it's all better than mine. All right. Thank you. They see in the African People's Socialist Party a vanguard for the struggle for the liberation of our people. They see that because not just what we do here in the United States, but because we had the temerity to do like Garvey, to do like Malcolm X, and take the struggle of black people around the world.
Uhuru, Uhuru comrades, this is Mwazi. Um, I hope everybody is um, tuned in right now, wherever you are. I'm in a different, different situation right now. We are on the ground here in San Diego and we're getting some things set up, but I just had to be in the community because comrades, we have to be on the ground in this fight back. And I, before I go any further, I just, oops, shoot, wow. Before I go any further, I just want to uh, salute those who are joining us right now from California. I see we have Missouri in the house. I see we have Maryland in the house, um, Minnesota, uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio in the house as well. And um, I'm gonna pull up my co-MC and Southwest Florida, Uhura MQ, good to see you comrade. I'm looking forward to seeing you, Gainesville, Florida. This is important because what, I'm, I'm not just naming, um, cities in, in this geographical area that we understand as, as, the, as America. I'm naming the fronts, the various fronts of the Hands Off Uhuru, Hands Off Africa Fight Back and the Fight Back Coalition. Um, and, and we're gonna learn more about this coalition and who we are, but I really wanted to take a moment today to um, you know, acknowledge that we are in a period right now where the world is changing. The world is changing right before our eyes. And, we are not here to just explain the world, comrades. We are here to change the world. And we see it changing already. And we see um, what is, um, you know, incessant violence and genocide, you know, which was only brought about and introduced into the world as we know it through colonialism. And this is the understanding that I've come to as a student of Amalia Shetela and of the African People's Socialist Party. And so I just want to salute um, everyone for being here. And I'm just giving a little bit of time. It looks like People are coming in the room and it's great to see you. Uhu and Helika from San Diego, right on. Um, good to see you, comrade. Um, so before I go any further, I wanna introduce my co-MC who's on this um, with me, um, Akile Anayi, who is a member of um, the African People's Socialist Party, one of the Uhu of four. And thank you, comrade, for being here. It's good to see you. Um, we have a very important topic that we're going to discuss today. And, you know, it's, like I said, it's about um, not just explaining the world, but changing the world. And this is a period where um, we are seeing, you know, um, through even the Fight Back Coalition, a, um, for the first time, people, you know, groups and organizations and anybody who just wants to be free, uniting that, you know, basically it's enough, it's enough. And this program today um, is going to give us a chance to learn about What's happening right now in Palestine um, is happening um, right before our, our, our eyes in the most violent way. And here we are um, with an opportunity to not just um, say, you know, as to not just support through this teaching, but to educate us on what needs to be done to help overturn this parasitic system. Because um, as colonized people around the world, we understand the, um, that we are the host. And this, and, and this parasite is dying and it's at its last grip and its last breath. And it is so exciting to see it go down. So Uhuru, um, Director Akile, thank you for being here. Uhuru, Chair Mwazi, well, I just really wanna appreciate this <laughs> overview and this teaching, which is extremely important, especially in the war of ideas, which we know, um, you know, we were able to see, you know, uh, this video here that shows, you know, the kind of, uh, dem you know, the demonstration of the world changing and how people um, are, you know, uh, coming to the right side of history, standing with the colonized and oppressed, you know, of the world. And these are the things that they don't want us to hear about. And, you know, the fact is that everything we've been bombarded with, you know, um, especially like if you're in the belly of the beast in the U.S., you can't even find, you know, information from the point of yes. view of the colonized, of Palestinians. And, everything is, you know, coming in, in support of the, this illegitimate um, Israeli settler colonial state. So this is extremely uh, critical, like you said, um, not, not just for the purposes of teaching us um, history, but also instructing us on what we have to do at this critical uh, moment in history as the world literally is turning, uh, you know, for the better towards uh, a future, you know, um, that's going to be constructed through the liberated hands of African people and colonized people all over the world. So we're <laughs> Uhuru, yes, um, Uhuru, comrade. And with that, we have some of the, um, th those who are on the front of this fight back um, as really special guests that we have with us today. So I just want to, um, without further ado, acknowledge that this program will be packed with everything that we need to know and to get us connected and um, forward to November 4th. So comrades, 
I'm going to begin by reading the statement. Um, and this statement is a statement uh, of the African People's Socialist Party, the Hands Off Who Fight Back Coalition. And we're gonna pull it up on the screen. Um, if you do want to read, you can also go to handsoffforwho.org and you can read along with us. Um, and this uh, statement, you know, we call for colonialism must go. And this is our stand with Palestine, Uhuru. Hands Off Who Fight Back Coalition stands in deep unity with the Palestinian people's historic anti-colonial counter-offensive against the US-backed colonial settler state of Israel. The African, indigenous, Mexican, Filipino, Cuban, Venezuelan, and other oppressed peoples of the world stand together with Palestine in a united front against colonialism, our common enemy. Our unity with Palestine goes beyond well-wishing. We recognize that their struggle and ours are interwoven in our shared global anti-colonial project to overturn the parasitic, blood-sucking colonial mode of production built on the stolen labor and lives of enslaved Africans and on the stolen land and genocide committed against the indigenous people. From St. Louis, Missouri to Gaza, it is clear, a new day in history has arrived. The colonial world order built on our suffering and exploitation is coming to an end. Evidence of this new era of anti-colonial resistance is exploding throughout the world, in Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, Haiti, or Haiti, Palestine, and in African, Mexican, and indigenous communities throughout the US. The colonial powers know the oppressed peoples are breaking free of their stranglehold. On July 29, 2022, they deployed hundreds of militarized FBI forces on seven homes and offices of the African People's Socialist Party and Uhuru Movement, including its founder and leader, Chairman Omalia Shetela, sparking the formation of the Hands Off Uhuru Fight Back Coalition. These raids and the subsequent indictment of Chairman Omalia Shetela and the Uhuru Three on bogus charges revealed not the strength of imperialist white power, but its weakness and decline in the face of a rapidly changing world of which Gaza is another shining example. We denounce all of the brutal, desperate acts by the global counterinsurgency to try to stop the forward motion of human progress. This includes Israel's ongoing barbaric, genocidal slaughter of the Palestinians in, in Gaza. The Israeli military has launched over 1,000 airstrikes in the past, this, this was three days ago, but you know, three days killing over 900 Palestinians and obliterating mosques, hospitals, and other health facilities, medical teams, and ambulances. Palestinian bloodshed extracted brutally by Zionist thugs is what birthed the state of Israel. Israel was formally established in 1948 as a culmination of a genocidal process known as a Nakba, in which Zionist terrorists slaughtered Palestinians, burned their villages, and expelled nearly a million of them from their homeland. In 1967, Israel expanded its occupation of Arab land to include Gaza, West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Golan Heights. The founding of Israel on Palestinian land was the initiation of a constant, unending state of warfare against Palestinian people for the past 75 years. Over 200 Palestinians were killed by Israel in the past year alone. Thousands of Palestinians are locked down in Israeli prisons where they are starved and tortured. Israel has announced a complete siege, a quote unquote, complete siege of Gaza, cutting off all access to electricity, food, water, and fuel in the densely populated open air prison where 2.1 million Palestinians, more than half of them children, have been suffering under an enhanced vicious blockade for the past 16 years. We reject ruling class uh, media's slanderous designation of the Palestinian people's resistance um, organizations as quote unquote terrorists. The Palestinian people have, have the right to resist. And while, in, while the US media claims that Hamas waged a quote unquote unprovoked attack on Israel, the truth is that the mere existence of Israel itself is a provocation against the Palestinians. Throughout its more than 50 years of existence, the African People's Socialist Party has united firmly with the Palestinian people. Chairman Omalia Shetela has consistently stood shoulder to shoulder with the Palestinians in their just and righteous struggle for national liberation. This stand by the APSP represents the continuum of an anti-colonial unity demonstrated by the Black Liberation Movement historically 
as embodied by the great Malcolm X who visited Gaza Strip in 1964, just one year before he was assassinated by the FBI and US government. As Chairman Omalia Shatella has stated, what is known as quote unquote Israel is in fact a white nationalist illegitimate colonial settler state built on pillage, land theft and genocide. No different from the colonial settler states of the US, Canada, Australia, South Africa, and New Zealand. Israel receives more than more US funding for weapons than all other countries combined. Israel operates as a military outpost of US imperialism in the Middle East, facilitating access to resources and serving as a tool for US colonial policy in the Arab world and in Africa. The courage of the Palestinian people to stand up and fight back is an inspiration to colonize people everywhere. As this statement is being written and read, the US is spending more ships, aircrafts, and, and munitions to the Israeli military, but no amount of bombs will succeed in, annihil in annihilating the will of the Palestinians and oppressed colonized peoples of the world to fight and win our liberation and independence. Hands Off Uhuru Fight Back Coalition calls for all freedom loving people in the US and around the world to converge on Washington DC on November 4th, 2023 for the 15th annual Black People's March on the White House led by the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace and Reparations. The Black People's March will represent a turning point in the emergence of the anti-colonial free speech movement and will uphold the leadership and demands by Africans indigenous people, Palestinians, and all who fight and resist colonial oppression. Black People's March on the White House will demand the US government drops the charges on the Uhuru Three, Chairman Amalia Shatella, and Uhuru Solidarity leaders, Penny Hess and Jesse Neville, who face bogus, quote unquote, foreign agent charges for fighting against genocide for African people and for reparations. Black, the Black People's March will demand the release of all political prisoners, including Mumia Abu-Jamal, Leonard Peltier, and the Holy Land Five, the Palestinian men imprisoned by the US on false charges of quote unquote material support for terrorism. All out to the Black People's March on the White House, November 4th, hands off Uhuru, hands off Africa, free, free Palestine, colonialism must go, Uhuru. Uhuru. Um, so I just want to um, say free, free Palestine and um, colonialism must go. And there is no other way to put it, but like we said, we are here to, um, to make, make, make this real. Um, one thing I just wanna say that I really appreciate and Director Keeley, I, I, I know you would unite with this um, because uh, we are not just, saying these things, we are not just idealists. We have, you know, material means in, in, in order to compete and to contend, to contend with this apparatus. And so I'm saying this because we are, um, we have a goal to raise, to continue to raise resources towards the fight back for the hands off of who fight back coalition. And um, we will have uh, our comrades come on later to help us meet our goal, but we want people to start right now by going to handsoffuhuru.org slash donate and making a contribution to today's program. So um, we're gonna go ahead and uh, welcome up. I think our next speaker is here. And if not, St. Louis on the ground can let me know. Um, but uh, <clears throat> Director Keeley, we're gonna go into our teaching now. Right. So let's get our pens out and let's, yeah, let's go ahead and start. Uhuru. Well, let's see how we got here. <clears throat> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So um, <clears throat> first and foremost, I uh, want to just echo what Comrade Chair Mwazi has said, and uh, we'll need to go to the to the beginning here, um, but just want to echo free, free Palestine and, you know, just totally denounce the illegitimate settler colonial state that is Israel, which is you know, um, uh, a part of a, a colonial mode of production, a whole entire colonial project that, you know, um, is reflective of learn from the best settler colonialists, um, including uh, those of which forged uh, what's called the United States, what's called a North America today, um, you know, uh, the different um, so-called countries inside of Africa and the various settler colonies that exist throughout the world um, that have been defined by the colonizer whose names have been removed 
um, you know, uh, off of its, and, and the indigenous populations removed, you know, from these places and renamed, rebranded uh, by the colonizer. So we're here to put all of this right side up. And, and that's why we stand in full uh, uh, solidarity and in support of the Palestinian liberation struggle that's going on. So again, want to say free, free Palestine. <clears throat> so, on, so on October 7th of 2023, the Palestinian resistance movement in the Gaza Strip led by Hamas and Islamic Jihad, launched a historic counteroffensive against the Israeli settler colonial occupation regime, reportedly firing over 5,000 rockets and fighting by ground, sea, and air using hang gliders with parachutes. Hamas has named the resistance campaign Operation Al-Aqsa Flood with the name Al-Aqsa referencing the sacred mosque in Jerusalem, which has been violated and desecrated numerous times by Israel and where Palestinian worshipers have repeatedly been attacked by the Israeli colonial occupation forces over the past year. The Palestinian freedom fighters courageously broke through the militarized borders of the Gaza Strip using bulldozers after ingeniously deploying drones to dismantle the Israelis' remote surveillance technology and machine guns, deliberately misleading the Israelis on calls they knew were monitored by the IDF. They brilliantly took advantage of the arrogance of the Israelis who assumed they had the Palestinians under control and over relied on technology to do their colonial dirty work for them. And, and this should remind us of another courageous struggle that we've seen in history, um, the, um, the Vietnamese revolution um, where you, know, you saw these colonial powers descend on Vietnam um, thinking that they were going to win that struggle. And, you know, uh, the, the people of Vietnam pulled together everything they had, used all of their brilliance, their genius, and, and you know, and crushed the colonial powers, including the U.S. And so that was a huge defeat. And, you know, we're saying two, three, you know, um, many more Vietnams, and we're seeing it right now with Palestine. So the Palestinians reclaimed control of every Israeli settlement along the Gaza border, seizing control of a police station, checkpoints, the headquarters of the Southern Israeli Military Command and attacking over 20 Israeli military bases, capturing over 100 Israeli occupation soldiers. The Israeli army was taken completely by surprise. And the Hamas military commander, Mohammed Daif, issued a statement declaring, we have decided to put an end to all of the occupation's crimes the time is over for them to act without accountability. Today, the people reclaimed their revolution, corrected their path, and returned to the march of return. <clears throat> the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has launched a genocidal war on the Palestinian or on Palestinians in Gaza. They have cut off all access to food, water, electricity, fuel, and medicine. Thousands of airstrikes have been launched, destroying entire neighborhoods obliterating apartment buildings, mosques, hospitals, and other health facilities, ambulances. 400,000 Palestinians are homeless in Gaza Strip now, and the military or and the Israeli military has given the Palestinians 24 hours to evacuate from uh, northern Gaza, where over 1 million Palestinians live. If this is a blatant genocidal, uh, this is blatant genocide, right? Uh, being committed by the Israeli government with the full support and advanced weaponry provided by the U.S. government. Over 20, uh, 2,200 or so 2,200 Palestinians have been killed, including hundreds of children, and almost 9,000 have been injured in Israel, um, you know, in Israeli airstrikes. So it's clear the state of Israel is expected to launch a ground invasion um, of the Gaza Strip in, in the coming days. And this is what we are experiencing on today around the world. Um, and of course, the US has pledged its full support, right, for Israeli genocide, Palestinians sending more aircraft, ships, and munitions to, um, you know, from the US President Joseph Biden, who has extended the US government's ongoing support for Israel, stating that US support for Israel is quote unquote rock solid. So here we can see the U.S. Uh, you know, again, this pledge and what what this is meaning for um, for our colonized brothers and sisters, and it's to understand that the Palestinian struggle is a struggle against colonialism. So what is happening in Palestine today is um, is colonialism, and um, I'm sorry, Director Kile, I have a little contradiction. Can you pick up right there for me? Absolutely. So um, as Sharon Wazey was just saying, what is happening in Palestine today? is a war for national liberation. And I know we've seen a lot of um, definitions by the colonial media, by the colonizer about what this 
struggle is all about. We've heard terrorist attacks and things like that. No, what we're seeing in Palestine is a war for national liberation that is part and parcel of the global anti-colonial struggle exploding throughout the world. The struggle of the Palestinians is our struggle, the struggle against colonialism. As defined by the African People's Socialist Party, colonialism is the total domination of a whole people by a hostile foreign state power for the economic benefit of the oppressor nation. Colonialism is not a policy of Israel or the US or France. It is the mode of production underlying the existence and power of each of these colonial entities. It is a mode of production in which European wealth is built on stolen African, indigenous, and colonized human beings, labor, land, resources, and a process that established the existing world economy. That's extremely critical you know, to understand because the, the, the situation in Palestine and the US support of this settler uh, colonial regime is not because they are even opposed to what happened to the Jews in Europe, it's uh, economic interests that are there in the Middle East, and this serves as, you know, an ability for the colonial powers to be able to continue uh, sucking the blood and resources off of the places in which they've carved up for themselves. <clears throat> All right, so Chair Moise is back. Yes, thank you, Director Akile. Um, yeah, parasitic world economy born from the assault on Africa and the enslavement and colonization of African people. So as we just discussed, this colonial uh, mode of production is the foundation of the parasitic colonial capitalist world economy born from this assault on Africa and the invasion of Africa and enslavement of millions of African human beings as the first commodity of capitalism and the historic and the ongoing co uh, you know, col uh, colonization of Africa and African people all around the world. <clears throat> It is a colonial mode of production built through the genocide against the indigenous peoples of the so-called Americas and brutal theft and occupation of their land by European settlers. As Chairman Amalia Shatella has said, without genocide, slavery, and colonialism, there would be no United States of America. Colonialism is the basis for the wealth of the U.S., Europe, and the white colonizer population. Settler colonialism is when the colonizer invades and inhabits the land of the colonized, expelling the natives from their homeland and establishing a settler colonial government to reign over the lives of those who remain. Israel is the settler colonizer. Palestine is the colonized. Israeli Jews are the settler colonizers. Palestinian Arabs are the colonized. The main contradiction, therefore, is not Israeli quote unquote apartheid or racism, but settler colonialism itself. The theft of the Palestinian land is the basis of the current explosion of colonial violence against the legitimate resistance of Palestinian people. This settler colonialism is no different from Zimbabwe, South Africa, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and indeed the United States. The US is in fact the largest illegitimate white nationalist colonial settler regime on the planet Earth forged through the genocidal murder and displacement of the indigenous people and their confinement into concentration camps, euphemistically labeled reservations. The state of Israel was founded in 1948 as a <clears throat> consequence of a vicious genocidal process in which Europeans, in this case Jews, slaughtered and expelled the indigenous inhabitants of Palestine and stole their land at gunpoint. All of the land currently occupied by the state of Israel is land that belongs to the Palestinian people. The ideology created to justify the state of Israel is called Zionism. Zionism was developed by an Austro-Hungarian Jew named Theodor Herzl in the late 19th century. Herzl authored the book, The Jewish State. As Herzl saw it, the project of establishing a Jewish state in Palestine was the means by which European Jews could seek to advance their interests within the colonial mode of production. He was clear that it would require the elimination of the Palestinian people. The Zionist movement under Herschel worked to win support from the major European imperialist powers for the Zionist colonization of Palestine. Uh -huh. And Zionism, you know, was from its inception in the entry point into the colonial mode of production for a sector of the European population. You know, as the chairman has pointed out, the, uh, the Zionist movement in Europe was consolidated less than a decade after the Berlin Conference. This was that conference where 
1884, these countries, which now, if you look at the UN, you know, it doesn't look any different, you know, represented, uh, you know, waged this, this attack on Africa by, you know, chopping up the land like a piece of pie and where the imperialist governments gathered, right? And they carved this up amongst themselves. And in fact, Palestine was not the only place considered by the Zionists as a location um, for the Jewish, you know, settler state. They also considered Uganda and Kenya. Um, you know, so Zionism, again, was the entry point to this colonial mode of production and to, um, you know, as a sector of the ruling class and how they wage it out. Uh -huh. And you, you can, can find many, yeah, go, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> and, and well, just that you can find, you know, you know, don't, you don't have to take our word for it, even though all of this is a matter of historical record that, um, you know, you can he hear and see fine quotations from Zionist leaders, including Herzl and um, Jabotinsky and others leading up to Netanyahu today, openly proclaiming their understanding that Zionism is a colonial project and that it fundamentally requires the oppression and destruction of the Palestinians. And Jabotinsky says here, quote, Zionism is a colonizing adventure and therefore it stands or falls on the, the question of armed forces. Palestine and uh, Palestinians had existed, right, for thousands of years. And the, uh, you know, we have some images here, but the geographical entity today that's called Palestine has been a recognized country, at least since Roman times. Palestine was a thriving Arab society, mostly rural, with vibrant, you know, urban centers and the coastal network of ports and towns boomed right, through their trade connections. European crusades sought and failed to conquer Palestine in the 11th century and rich agricultural industry, small towns and historical cities served as a population of half a million, um, you know, on the eve of the Zionist invasion. And so, um, you know, we've been here, nobody discovered us, right? Uhuru. And uh, so here, Muslims, Jews and Christians coexisted in Palestine before the Zionist invasion. <clears throat> so Muslims, Jews, Christians, again, co co coincided during this time. And this is contrary to the myth perpetuated in the bourgeois media that the so-called Israeli-Palestinian conflict is simply a religious feud between the Muslims and the Jews and um, et cetera. 1916, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, European colonizers carve up the Middle East. So from the late 1800s onwards, waves of Zionist set, um, settlements began happening in Palestine with European Jews buying up land through the Jewish National Fund laying the foundation for the eventual Zionist takeover by force. Then in 1916, in what was known as the uh, uh, Sykes-Picot Agreement, uh, European colonizers carved up the Middle East, just as they did in Africa, signing a secret treaty between French and British to, to divide up the Middle East. Looks like we had a little bit of breakup in uh, in the location where Comrade Chair is. <clears throat> is. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and pick up for her and, and uh -huh. so we. Oh, uh -huh. thank you. Uh -huh. oh, okay, we can hear you now. You're good. Okay, but why don't you continue just to avoid that happening okay. again for this one? Thank you, Comrade. Mm -hmm. So um, just to wrap up this slide, just um, uh, repeating that in 1916, in what was known as the Sykes-Picot Agreement, European colonizers carved up the Middle East, just as they did in Africa, signing a secret treaty between French and British to divide up the Middle East into, quote unquote, areas of interest slash influence and control. And in 1917, with the Balfour Declaration, British officially pledged their support for the Jewish occupation of Palestine. The Balfour Declaration was a public statement issued by the British government in 1917 during the First World War, announcing support for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. In 1920, after the First Imperialist World War, the newly established League of Nations meets in Italy to officially divide the Middle East up between European imperialists. This is when Palestine comes under British control. It was also during this period when the imperialist powers of the world were involved in Southwest Africa, a period during which Marcus Garvey proclaimed Africa for the Africans. This period in Palestinian history, when it was under British control is known as the mandatory period. It was during this time 
when the invasion of Zionist settlers into Palestine accelerated. Between 1936 and 1939, the Palestinians rose up in what became known as the Great Palestinian Revolt, fiercely resisting British imperialism and Jewish settler colonialism. They were ultimately crushed by British using counterinsurgency tactics, collective punishment, dem demolition of homes, later adopted by the Israeli state. The Great Revolt was sparked by, assass by the assassination of Iz Adin al qassam a beloved Arab resistance leader in 1935. Today, Hamas's military unit, the Qassam Brigade, is named for him, and the rockets fired by Hamas are known as the Qassam rockets, showing the continuity of struggle by the Palestinians going back nearly 100 years. In 1947, the British turned Palestine over to the United Nations, who partitioned the land between the invaders and Palestinians. Jews at this point, still a minority, get more than half the land. Palestinians would get 42% of the land, while state for the Jews was to stretch over almost 56% of the lands. The Jews found this arrangement unacceptable. They wanted all of the land, and so they initiated what became known as the Nakba. This process of extermination and expulsion is known by the Palestinians as the Nakba, the catastrophe. It was a profoundly brutal genocidal onslaught. It involved gangs of Jewish terrorists, primarily groups like the Stern Gang, the Ergun, and the Haganah, working in conjunction to expel and destroy the Palestinians. The Zionists expelled 80% of the indigenous Palestinians from their homeland. Over 530 Palestinian villages were destroyed. Between 1947 and 1949, at least 800,000 Palestinians were made refugees beyond the borders of the state. Zionist forces had taken more than 78% of historic Palestine and killed 15,000 Palestinians in more than 70 massacres. Today, there are more than 7 million Palestinian refugees scattered around the world. And in 1967, Israel waged a colonial war to steal even more Arab land. After the so-called Six-Day War, the Israeli state expanded its colonial territory to include the West Bank, Gaza Strip, East Jerusalem and Syrian Golan Heights. The Palestinian people have always fought fiercely, including during the first Intifada or popular uprising, which lasted from 1987 to 1994, and the second Intifada, which lasted from 2000 to 2005, during which the Israeli government built a separation barrier in the West Bank. So Palestinians have never accepted, you know, the colonization of Palestine laying down that there has been resistance ever since the imposition of a settler colonial uh, regime, and there, at just as we see this resistance uh, happening today. It was during the first Intifada in 1987 that the Islamic resistance movement, also known as Hamas, was formed. In the year 2006, a year after the end of the second Intifada, the Palestinian people voted to elect Hamas as their leadership in the so-called occupied territories. The U.S. and Israel responded to this expression of the Palestinian people's democratic will by bombing the Gaza Strip and imposing a genocidal blockade preventing food, medicine, and other supplies from entering Gaza, a blockade which has been in place for more than 16 years. And we see this type of, you know, process, um, so-called, uh, you know, democratic process happen throughout the world. The U.S. does this to so many different, um, you know, countries we've seen, you know, just in within recent years. Uh, you know, initiating coups and um, initiating blockades and things like that in order to overturn real democratic processes in these areas. <clears throat> Gaza is often described as an open air prison. The same description could be used for the ghettos, barrios, and concentration camps in the U.S. where Africans, Mexicans, and indigenous people face the same colonial conditions. Despite the U.S. ruling class media's ridiculous claim that this past weekend's resistance campaign by Hamas was an unprovoked attack, the reality is that the state of Israel has been an un, in an unceasing state of war against Palestinians for 75 years. Between 2008 and 2021, over 5,739 Palestinians have been killed by Israel. At least 121,438 Palestinians have been injured. One third of these casualties have been Palestinian women and children. As Chairman Amalia Shatella has stated, Israel functions as a military outpost for U.S. imperialism in the Middle East. 
Israel is used by the U.S. to secure access to resources in that region and to provide U.S. imperialism with a strategically significant minion to carry out its aims and objectives in the Arab world and Africa. The U.S. provides more military financing to Israel than all other countries combined. U.S. annual resources to Israel is nearly $4 billion. <clears throat> Israel is part and parcel of a capitalist world economy sitting on a foundation of colonialism on the backs of African people. As one example, Israel is a major player in the trade of stolen diamonds from Africa, extending its reach into South Africa, Liberia, Congo, Ivory Coast, and other places, financing neo-colonial proxy armies in Africa that slaughter the people and uses the massive revenues from the diamond sales to bankroll their genocidal occupation of the Gaza and West Bank. Israel privately funded and supported the colonial apartheid regime of occupied Azania, or what's called South Africa today. In Israel, African Jews from Ethiopia, despite living in the so-called Jewish state, are treated viciously by white Israeli Jews as colonial subjects. White Israeli lynch mobs and police have attacked African people in Israel, and a report revealed that over 40% of African Jews serving in the army were being sent to military prison during their service. African women living in Israel have been subject to forced sterilization by the Israeli government. And in 2009, Israel launched airstrikes in Sudan, killing 119 African people. This is an image of George Floyd painted along the wall of the separation barrier in the West Bank, demonstrating the unity between African and Palestinian people against the colonial mode of production. The Palestinian struggle is our struggle. Chairman Amali Ishatella and the Uhuru movement have always stood in profound anti-colonial unity with the righteous struggle for national liberation of the Palestinian and Arab people and the destruction of the Israeli colonial settler state, as well as all neo-colonial petty bourgeois Arab regimes that do the bidding of the US and Europe to suppress the people and facilitate the theft of their resources. When Africans were engaged in resistance to colonial police terror in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, the Palestinians were sending messages to the young Africans via social media with encouragement and information on how to defend themselves against tear gas. In August of 2014, the Popular Front of the Liberation of Palestine issued a statement in support of the African resistance in Ferguson, stating that the Black struggle is leading the world. <clears throat> Chair Mwazi, mm -hmm. okay, we're up. <laughs> Yeah, appreciate you, Director Akila. And I think just really want to uh, say that, uh, as we know, on July 29, this this raid that happened on the um, seven homes and properties of the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru Movement, here is the image uh, that we captured on our video camera in St. Pete, at outside of the Uhuru House in uh, St. Petersburg, Berg, Berg, Florida, and also uh, the attack on the home of Chairman Amalia Shatella and Deputy Chair Ona Zine Yeshatella in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, here is an image of the uh, IDF raids on the Palestinian offices in August 2022, and which just a matter of fact was weeks later in August of the same year. Um, and the Israeli police raided six offices of Palestinian organizations in the West Bank. And the security camera and footage of the Israelis raids, as you can see here, is like strikingly similar to the footage of the FBI raids in the Uhuru movement. This is... Um, you know, part of the colonial apparatus, you know, what is the police here is the military, um, you know, in your hood. And as we know, comrades, though, the world is changing. And, I, you know, we call on Africans to unite with the Palestinian people in their struggle to overturn their colonial domination. Um, all around the world, all oppressed peoples, all colonized peoples are rising up and colonialism is on its deathbed. And we're gonna put it on its deathbed through uh, this fight back of the Hands Off Who Fight Back Coalition. We are calling and we are winning, we are building the anti-colonial free speech movement. Um, this, is a, this is a movement that will uh, take the struggles of all the people to the end. And as we say, we are calling on people to join us on the ground, um, all out for November 4th, the Black People's March on the White House, the 15th annual Black People's March on the White House. Um, from DC to Los Angeles, to London, to Pretoria, in occupied Ozania, we say free, free Palestine, say hands off Uhuru, hands off Africa, say drop the charges against the Uhuru three, not one step backward, forward ever, Backwards never. 
Uhuru, Uhuru Director Kile. Uh, so uh, we're gonna keep uh, moving on with our program and we just want to uh, acknowledge uh, a speaker who was not able to be here today, uh, Naveen Ayesh who's a member of the um, American Muslims for Palestine. Um, and as we know, our uh, comrades are, are, you know, there's a lot happening right now. So we appreciate and just want to send solidarity. And we, speaking of solidarity, I'm going to also invite up another um, presentation that we'll have during today's teaching. And it's an important question. Um, it's the Jewish question. And we're um, bringing up uh, a solidarity member who is one of the who are three, Jesse Neville, who is the chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Um, and he is here to speak on the Jewish question um, as uh, a member of this, the uh, um, Uhuru Solidarity Movement and through the lens of African internationalism. So I want to appreciate you, uh, Chair Jesse, for being on, on the ground in St. Louis, Uhuru. 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 I would like to begin by giving another round of applause to that powerful project. And I just want to start by expressing what a great honor it is to have the opportunity to participate in this incredibly important teaching. And I want to salute the leadership of the Hands Off Uhuru Fight Back Coalition. I want to salute Chair Mwazi Odom and the presentation that was just given along with uh, Director Akile Anai, um, who leads the uh, info ed tech uh, front of the Hands Off Uhuru campaign. And I also want to deeply salute my leadership in the African People's Socialist Party, Chairman Omalia Shatella and Deputy Chair Ona Zanea Shatella, and all of the leaders of the African People's Socialist Party worldwide, and express that as a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, that everything I have come to understand and can express today has come through being and working under the leadership of Chairman Omalia Shatella. And I also want to salute and acknowledge. Uh, Penny Hess, the chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Committee, who is also here with us today. And as was mentioned, I am a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, which is the organization of white people formed by and working under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party to organize in the white community with this specific and strategic assignment to win other white people like ourselves to stand in solidarity with African and colonized peoples and their struggle for liberation and to fight for reparations to African people. And so as part of that assignment to organize white people like myself, I appreciate the opportunity and, and the call to speak to other white people like myself who are also Jews. I was raised in a Jewish family and therefore like most Jewish people, I was raised in an environment where I was taught that to be Jewish is to be loyal to the state of Israel, to defend Israel right or wrong, and that to do anything otherwise is to betray your people or even to hate them as a so-called self-hating Jew. While for more than half a century, it is true an overwhelming majority of Jewish people have given enthusiastic support to the state of Israel. It is also clear that today, the anti-colonial struggle has shattered the absolute unity of the Jewish population with the Israeli colonial settler state. I saw a video earlier today of a demonstration of hundreds of Jewish people in New York who came out to say, not in our name. And this is good. We salute this, we applaud this, and I am here to speak for and to all of those Jewish people, including in Israel, where many Jews in this country, including myself, have relatives who live there, to say that what the anti-colonial struggle is calling on us to do is yes, to question and to criticize the actions of Israel, but also to do more than that, to say that as Jews, we have a responsibility to completely oppose the Israeli colonial settler state built on stolen and occupied Palestinian land. As Jews, we have a responsibility to unite unconditionally 
with the right of the Palestinian people to resist, to fight, to struggle, to do whatever is necessary to win their total liberation. We have to deal with this question because the explanation given for the existence of Israel to begin with and its ongoing violence against the Palestinian people is that it is being done for the protection of Jews, that it is being done to secure the interests and safety of the Jewish population. And so this means that literally, not figuratively, the carnage and brutality and genocide that is being carried out by the Israeli military as we speak is being done in our name as Jewish people under a Jewish white and blue flag with a Jewish star of David by a government that calls itself the Jewish state. So there's no way around that. And in making the argument that this is done for the Jewish people, inevitably the first thing that will be invoked and promoted by the colonial ruling class and the Israeli government is the idea that the creation of the state of Israel was necessary because of what happened to Jewish people in Germany, in Europe in the 1930s and 40s in what is referred to as the Nazi Holocaust. The idea that the Nazi persecution of European Jews made the Israeli settler state necessary begs the obvious question. <laughs> who was it who put the Jews in the gas chambers of Germany? Was it Palestinians? No, it was not. It was white people. It was other Europeans. And so as Chairman Amalia Shatella has posed the question, if the persecution of European Jews by other Europeans justified the creation of a Jewish state for Jewish protection, then why, the chairman asks, did we not take Frankfurt or Berlin? How did it make sense for Jews to protect ourselves from European Nazis by going to Arab people's land and stealing their land and committing genocide against them and creating a colonial settler state on their occupied land? It doesn't make sense. <clears throat> because the truth is the creation of the, the Jewish state was not really done as a form of self-defense against European violence and colonial white power. It was done by a sector of European Jews with the full support of the colonial powers of the world as an avenue through which this sector of the European population could integrate into European imperialism, could advance our interests within the colonial mode of production at the expense of the Palestinian people in a system built on the backs of African people. As Chairman Omalia Shatella has taught us, this question of the so-called Holocaust and its weaponization by the imperialist ruling class, however, is even deeper than that. Not only is it used to justify the torture and extermination of the Palestinians, but it is also used, as Chairman Omalia Shatella has stated, as an ideological tool of imperialism to silence Africans, Arabs, and all colonized peoples when they struggle against their oppression. It goes back to the very origin of the word genocide, a definition, a term created by a Polish Jew named Raphael Lemkin after the Second Imperialist War after the persecution of Jews in Europe and adopted as the legal definition of this new term genocide by the United Nations, which means that as the Uhura movement has pointed out, there was no word for genocide when King Leopold of Belgium slaughtered 20 million Africans in the Congo. There was no word for genocide when tens of millions of indigenous people on this land were slaughtered by European settlers and forced into concentration camps euphemistically referred to as reservations. There was no word for genocide when thousands of African people were lynched and hanged from trees and burned alive and tortured and mutilated by white terrorists in the United States for over a hundred years at the turn of the, the century. And when African people went to the United Nations in the early 1950s to use Raphael Lemkin's definition of genocide to charge the United States with the crime of genocide against black people in the US, Raphael Lemkin himself denounced them and said that they were actually functioning as agents in a Russian conspiracy. 
which is exactly what they are saying now about Chairman Omalia Shetela and the Uhuru movement for doing the same thing. The experience of European Jews at the hands of other Europeans is elevated in the colonial historical narrative to the ultimate crime ever committed by human beings against other human beings. And in some schools in Florida, it is even illegal to compare anything else to it. I believe it is important for Jews to publicly reject this notion because when people question this idea, which is at the very heart of the ideological foundation of the state of Israel, you can earn the wrath of the bourgeoisie by being labeled an anti-Semite, a term which can end careers, destroy livelihoods, and in some parts of Europe, even land you in jail. In the year 2020, Chairman Amalia Shetela was scheduled to speak at a conference on reparations at San Diego State University. He was disinvited from speaking. His free speech trampled on when Jewish Zionist student organizations uh, attacked the organizations putting on that conference for having the chairman speak because they said Chairman Omalia Shetela was an anti-Semite for past remarks that he made about Israel and Jewish people. And I, I found the quote, they actually quote what the chairman said, so I found the full statement. I want to read it to you because ironically, the statement that caused these Zionists to ban the chairman from speaking in San Diego State, to me, sums up perfectly the message that needs to reach the brains of Jewish people around the world. He said, however many Jews were killed in Germany, they killed them. They were not killed by Iranians. They were killed by white people in Europe. The chairman continues, I truly believe that Jewish people have a responsibility to denounce the illegitimate state of Israel to express solidarity with the just struggles of the Palestinians and other oppressed peoples. What killed the Jews was capitalism and other white people in Germany and other places. So don't put this thing about Jews on Palestinians and Iranians and black people when what you have is a mess about white people. These were the chairman's words. <laughs> so Despite the best efforts of the student, the Jewish Zionist student organizations in San Diego State, it is my intention to do whatever I can and to organize to bring this message here from the chairman to Jewish people everywhere. That's the message that we need to hear, that it is time to turn our backs on white power. It is time to stand with African, Palestinian, and oppressed peoples of the world. Are we going to stand by and allow a government in our name on our behalf, with our interests represented on their flag, to launch missiles, to drop white phosphorus on people in Gaza Strip, to push out one million people in a genocidal forcible expulsion, to reduce 400,000 people to homelessness, and with US weapons to pulverize entire neighborhoods, to destroy mosques and hospitals, to turn the open air prison of Gaza into a, into a graveyard, of Palestinian bodies. It is, time to, it is time to move beyond white opportunism and forge a new principled revolutionary socialist anti-colonial stand of Jewish solidarity with Palestinian, African, and colonized peoples that requires we go beyond sympathy and tears and take on our role in the struggle against colonialism. The Jewish voice must be for a free independent Palestine, for the total and complete end to colonialism in all forms, for the dismantling of the illegitimate Israeli colonial settler state, and for the total emancipation of Palestine. Yes, one free Palestine from the river to the sea, not a two-state solution where the enslaved are expected to live side by side with the enslaver. The Jewish voice must decry the Zionist thugs who abuse and pervert the memory of Jews killed in European concentration camps to justify another thousand holocausts against the Palestinian people, to sanction Israel's heinous violence, torture, slaughter, and extermination of the Palestinians. And we cannot equivocate on this. We cannot say, I condemn the violence on both sides. To condemn the violence on both sides is to condemn the Palestinians 
and to excuse and condone the Israeli violence of genocide, full stop. That is what it means. We will not condemn the Palestinian resistance. We either unite with their right to resist or we don't. The oppressor does not get to say, I support your right to resist, but not that way. Not when you use that tactic. That is not what solidarity means. The final thing I would like to say is that when the Palestinians sent messages of solidarity to Africans rising up in Ferguson in 2014, it was because of the recognition that Ferguson is Gaza. Palestinians are colonized, Africans are colonized in the US and around the world. Indigenous people are colonized. America is the world's largest open air prison where a prison of nations, where African, Mexican and indigenous people are held in a state of colonial captivity. Jewish people in this country cannot walk over the bodies of Africans and indigenous people or past their righteous resistance movements to give lip service or well-wishing to the Palestinians. For Jews in this country to, to take on and truly unite with the anti-colonial resistance of the Palestinian people, no flight to Tel Aviv is necessary. We have a job to do right here in the belly of the beast. So again, the call to Jews is not a call for tears of sympathy. It is a call to take action, to do our part in the anti-colonial struggle. That means organizing in solidarity with the African revolution inside this country that puts us in unity with all of the colonized and oppressed peoples of the world fighting the same enemy. It means fighting for reparations to African people as an anti-colonial revolutionary demand. And for those Jews who ask, well, when the Palestinians are free, what will happen to the Jews? Where will they go? What will be expelled from Palestine will be colonialism. Yeah. What becomes of the colonizers will depend on where we stand in relationship to the struggle to destroy colonialism. <clears throat> the same question applies for white settlers here in North America or in South Africa or anywhere else. Our future will be determined by the stance that we take. So my message to Israeli Jews today is let the Israeli government have to fend for themselves. Colonialism is on its deathbed. The future looks like a free Palestine, a free Africa, a free African people, a free indigenous people. We can have a future, but not at their expense. We can have a future, but only in solidarity with the rest of humanity. That means we have to stand up, get organized under the leadership of the African revolution, and we have to fight. Victory to Palestine, victory to the African revolution, unity through reparations. Uh -huh. Uhuru, Uhuru, um, Chair Jesse, just really want to salute that profound statement, and um, that is that is African action, that is reparations in action, and that is um, African internationalism, what as we say, white uh, black power in white face, and we're taking all that power back in the hands of the people, and I just really want to salute your deepening that question, the as we have just um, characterized it as the, the Jewish question. So um, comrades, we are going to uh, move and I wanna uh, welcome up Chairman Amalia Shatella who's going to be speaking next. And as the chairman is um, coming up and, and ready, I just wanna share where people are tuning in from um, because we have a packed house um, from Houston, Texas to St. Louis, Missouri, Los Angeles, California, Arcata, California, um, San Diego, California, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Maryland, uh, Braddock, Pennsylvania, Pens uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, Chesapeake, Vir uh, Virginia, Southwest, Florida, Gainesville, Florida, St. Pete, Florida, Flossmoor, Illinois, Battle Creek, Michigan, Lexington, Kentucky, Denver, Colorado, New Jersey, London, and Fort Myers, Florida, and, and, and again, I said Kentucky, um, Lexington, Kentucky. So, um, just want to salute everybody who has come here to help deepen this question. And without further ado, I want to um, welcome Chairman Amalia Shatella, who is the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party and founder of the um, Uhura Movement and founder of the Burning Spear newspaper and the African Socialist International. So Uhura Chairman, welcome. Uhuru, Uhuru, comrades, thank you so very, very, very much, uh, comrade uh, Wazy. And I want to salute uh, 
this incredible teaching, what has uh, been occurring up to now, uh, an astound outstanding uh, uh, presentation that we just heard from Comrade Jesse Neville, uh, but then the entire introduction uh, that we've heard leading uh, to that presentation has just been uh, representative of a clearer understanding, a better place that we are involved in today in terms of the struggle against our oppression and oppression of the peoples of the world. So I want it, I think is extremely important to say that. And uh, as we saw some of us uh, uh, before we got fully into this discussion, there were images, videos, uh, images of uh, peoples around the world coming out in great numbers, millions of people in solidarity uh, with the people of Palestine. And uh, that was uh, tremendous because uh, one would not know that such solidarity existed, that the vast majority of the people around the world are uh, in solidarity with Palestine if, if we rely simply on the information that's provided to us by the media uh, sources here in the United States and probably in most of Europe. But the fact of the matter is that the peoples of the world are sympathetic uh, to Palestine, lean in the direction of Palestine. And those people who are conscious of what the real contradictions are that uh, binds this world and everybody in this world uh, uh, on the planet Earth uh, to uh, this kind of uh, vicious social system that locks us into states of oppression and, and uh, also uh, creates this uh, incredible a process of parasitism versus host and uh, uh, people who want to go beyond uh, just uh, trying to understand the Palestinian question as a simple incident. There's an incident this time, there's an incident the next time, there's a war over here this time, that time. What in the hell is going on? What is the origin? What is the source? What is the basis of all these contradictions we are confronted with? That's what people want to understand, and that's what African internationalism that we've been hear, hearing up to now uh, is expressing. We want to get to the source of the things. We don't, uh, uh, as quietly as it's kept, uh, this discussion is not a question against the Jews, and I, I want to make that quite clear. Uh, in fact, this is something that opens the door uh, to Jews to join the rest of us in terms of fighting against colonialism. It's been said uh, uh, up to now, it's been said before now, the presentation by Jesse Neville made the point uh, that uh, uh, this whole contradiction we are facing in the whole world again has its origin in colonialism. And it's a colonial mode of production. Look at how the world is constructed. Look at uh, how it actually is, as opposed to simply how it's reflected in the minds of people who are subject to domination uh, throughout this world uh, economy, this whole social system. Uh, you cannot see a place that is successful in the world that does not rely on colonial domination for its success. Uh, there's not a country in the world that does not allow, uh, uh, rely on the colonial domination uh, for its success. And I don't care where that is in the world. I don't care whether or not they themselves are colonizers or have been colonizers. They exist and participate in the world economy. It's a world economy that has its origin, that owes its existence, first of all, to a 600-year uh, uh, old assault that was made on Africa and the creation of a world economy for the first time in history through, uh, through transporting Africans to place, various places around the world. We hear about the genocide of the indigenous peoples in the Americas, what they call the Americas. You're hearing about the process of creating a world economy. Uh, uh, and this world economy uh, came about as a consequence of, of forcibly transferring Africans throughout the world, throughout the, what they now call the Americas, killing the indigenous people to take this land and the world economy springing from that, 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 that uh, uh, envelops the entire planet Earth. All of, all of the uh, economic activity in the world happens within the context of that world economy. There used to be a time in the 1960s where we saw uh, extraordinary revolutionary movements and a consciousness of revolutionary uh, uh, philosophy emerging. That, uh, uh, that made the assumption that the workers of the world uh, would be the ones who uh, would benefit for the new world that had to be constructed in order for there to be freedom. There used to be a time 
when you will see revolutionary movements happening in China, revolutionary movements happening in, in Russia, et cetera, based on those assumptions, Korea, all of that based on those assumptions, they were, they were talking about how all the peoples of the world could be free, uh, but the missing ingredient, the thing that was not understood, and this was one of the contradictions of what has been characterized as Marxism, which is something that uh, we talk about Marxism based on uh, 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 Marx's uh, 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 utilization of uh, uh, the scientific method of investigation analysis called, uh, called uh, dialectical materialism, something that's wasted on Marxists, you know, uh, unfortunately, because uh, what we did uh, was utilize this method of investigation and analysis. And when we came to was conclusions that are different from the conclusion that Marx came to uh, as it relates to how the world uh, could be connected and how the world should develop and who and what was going to take to make that happen. And what's going to take to make that happen, of course, is that those people who were characterized as Marx by Marx uh, uh, as primitive accumulation, that is the foundation upon which the entire social system rests, uh, those people, that's where the, 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 the source of liberation, the emancipation of everybody is based on that. And that's where the workers of the world will be, uh, the workers of the world or their existence uh, to the colonial mode of production. So we're saying that, that if you want to end a, a, a world of oppressed and oppressors and slaves and slave masters, then you assault colonialism. And not just as a policy of a particular country, perhaps when Portugal started off in, 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 in something like 1415, perhaps we were looking at a policy from Portugal. But it soon and very rapidly turned into more than a policy as more and more of the entities that we now know as Europe, entities that came into existence that became identified as Europe through this process, uh, it soon became more than just a policy, but it became uh, an actual system. It became a world economy. It became a mode of production that locked all of us into it. So we're not just talking about fighting a policy uh, in, 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 in occupied Palestine. We're talking about a mode of production that's locked us all into this particular relationship. That's why we have no hesitancy when we talk about uh, Palestine. We call on the Jews to, to join the rest of the world in fighting against this social system that's responsible for killing Jews uh, in, in Europe that we are talking about. It was this social system that killed the Jews. And so Jews have to be opposed to it. And so you come up with this, 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 this ridiculous argument that somehow, uh, in addition to the fact that uh, they are protecting themselves uh, from bad, uh, from things happening by taking Palestinian land, that somehow it's theirs because God gave it to them 6,000 years ago, they are chosen people. What's the difference than a chosen people who's taken this land and a chosen people who call themselves Nazis and talking about Aryans and stuff like that, the chosen people. And all the chosen people, they're doing this in the name of being chosen people and they murder people and they do the worst kinds of things because to become a chosen people is to dehumanize every damn body else. And that's what they've been able to do. So that's what happened to us. We became dehumanized. That becomes a philosophy. It becomes a part of the, of the definition that springing from uh, a mode of production that has its origin in slavery and colonialism. Along with that, there, there is uh, ideas and a system of, 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 of the philosophy and institutions that, that spring from that reality. And that's murderous. So you have people whose consciousness, just think about this. There was no such thing as an American. There was no such thing as an American. An American, that's a Portuguese name, if I'm not mistaken. America, this, this music, was that Portuguese or Italian? Uh, 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 the, the Italian. So the point is, however, that this is something that was named uh, and imposed on the people. There was no such thing. So the, the first identity, that collective identity uh, for Europeans who came to this country is a, as a, comes from an Italian. It doesn't come from anybody who was indigenous to this land. And so when you start talking about attacking the social system, then there's a huge stake in this so, because all of the white people have owed their identity to this process of enslaving Africans, taking the indigenous lands. And that's generally true of the whole world that we live in. So you have, you have philosophy, you have systems, you have organizations that institutionalize that, that justify murdering Palestinians, murdering Arabs, murdering Africans, and, uh, and, and the rest of us in order, and, and that is defined as civilized. So here you have civilized behavior 
coming from the most uncivilized and bestial uh, activity that, that, that the world has ever seen, ever seen. Nobody has ever seen the kind of stuff that we've seen occur on the planet Earth subsequent to the emergence of this colonial mode of production. This is, this is what we're looking at. And yet, it's those, are the, those are the ones who define what is, what is civilized, what is legal, what is democratic, et cetera. So you can have a situation where uh, uh, somebody can attack uh, and take the people's land. You got the whole land. You got the whole uh, land that's been taken from the people. You have a whole population now that comes in and takes their land, achieve their identity at the expense of the Palestinians. This, because this is where the identity of Israel has come from. Uh, they resurrect a dead language uh, uh, and make a, their language uh, a Hebrew uh, and impose everything, all the laws, et cetera, on the Palestinian people from whom the land has been stolen. So uh, as we said that that uh, slavery the, for the for the slavery for the enslaved freedom is illegal for the colonized freedom is illegal so everything that that the Palestinians do to try to be free is illegal and what is legal is keeping them from from winning their freedom this is the kind of world that we live in and this is the thing that we have to recognize and that a difficulty that we are confronted with in part uh, is the inability of, of, of the so-called left, the white left, uh, that is easy uh, to uh, accept the definition of capitalism and, and communism, et cetera, as long as it stems from a contradiction between what? Between the so-called industrial work, workers and the industrialized uh, bourgeoisie, which is white people. As long as the struggle is, con is one that, that uh, relies on that. And that's what we see throughout history. That's what we're looking at right now. So, so we can talk about uh, uh, how the Palestinians uh, who come across uh, uh, in hang gliders, they're not using F-15s, they're using hang gliders you know, to come in. And they talk about how this is so mysterious and how they, they undermine all this British intelligence. You have to be able to get around the intelligence of the oppressor. Every black person who lives in America is every day working to get around the intelligence apparatus that they have. Every Palestinian, every oppressed person on a daily basis, because if you don't get around the intelligence, you can't lie. They, put, they live, they put together processes and systems, they take your babies, they do all this other kind of stuff, and all the time we're working how to get around this stuff that they impose on us. So the, the Palestinians use a very sophisticated process of, of using primitive devices and stuff like that to fight against this highly mechanized and highly, uh, 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 you know, uh, well-defined scientific kind of process they set up and they've done. Say, wow, look at that, a damn hang glider. <laughs> a folding chair. <laughs> now, the thing is, that's, that becomes necessary because the oppressor always has the guns, always has the plans, whether it's the biggest stick, depending on where, how long ago it occurred, or, or whether it's the biggest gun, the most far-reaching, most scientific ability to crush people, kill people, the oppressor has that, not the oppressed. We wouldn't be the oppressed if you had the, that kind of weaponry. It takes that kind of weaponry to, to crush us and keep us oppressed. So I, I I'm, I'm also want to say that I hear uh, uh, this, I, I heard uh, somebody say that this supposed to be, the, this, this is what often happens, white people love us. I heard it while I was on the West Coast, white people love us when we said, we're calling on people to join us on November 4th for Black People's March, the anti-colonial uh, uh, free speech movement. Well, all the colonized people and, and it's happening under the hands of Uhuru uh, movement. Uh, Free the, the, the Uhuru three, drop the charges, the Black People's March on the White House, 15th annual mobilization, Black People's March on the White House. And so I hear this, this, this argument, this, this complaint that if you say it's the Black People's March on the White House, uh, then uh, people will be less inclined to attend it uh, because they think only Black people could march in it. Well, I'll be damned. So uh, is that the reason they block, they didn't come to all the other marches we've ever had? Is that the reason they don't join with all the pallet, with the Mexicans and indigenous people mobilization because they said the black people are indigenous people? No, the colonizer always has excuses for not being able to unite with the colon. They will unite with you in the struggle of some generalized kind of thing 
that does not identify the fact that we are struggling for the liberation of black people. We're struggling for the liberation of Mexican people. And I can say that without any hesitation, just as when the people rose up uh, in this magnificent revolutionary movement in Nicaragua, I didn't know in Nicaragua, but we organized the first mass movement for Nicaraguan, the struggle against Nicaraguan colonialism, a neo-colonial operation. You don't have to know them. I'm opposed to, to oppression, opposed to colonialism and neo-colonialism. That's why we joined. And that's why Black people have always joined these movements all around the world. We didn't have to say, you know, <laughs> it's just a ridiculous kind of specious argument that we run into even by the white people who love us. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and, uh, and then I hear this, uh, this uh, hypocritical criticism of Hamas. Uh, uh, say, yeah, you know, uh, we just opposed to, to everybody who's killing innocent people, you know, uh, and Hamas did this very brutal and killing all the innocent people, uh, et cetera. Uh, yeah, and we believe that the, the, the repression should stop with the Palestinians, but this Hamas thing. So what they put, this is just, just the most worst thing. Like they were, they were really doing stuff to change conditions before Hamas got involved, right? Which is ridiculous, but they do say they were doing things. They say, see, uh, there's certain stuff that the Biden administration and this administration have made certain kind of changes and they believe in thus and thus, uh, et cetera, because we have this nice, uh, innocent kind of project saying don't hurt the Palestinians. But the right of the Palestinians agency themselves uh, to move for their own liberation. If you believe in Palestinian liberation, and if the only thing that's manifesting itself to advance the struggle for their liberation, you can't say I believe in their liberation except for the liberators, for those who are leading the struggle. If it weren't for those who are leading the struggle, I'd be down with it. No, 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 no. That's a specious kind of argument. And this is not an argument for Hamas. This is an argument for integrity, for uniting with the struggle of colonized people who will set the terms who their leaders are, the Palestinian people elected Hamas as their leadership. They elected them despite everything that the United States and Israel did. They elected them. And then when they won the election, they did everything they could to kill it, to, to strangle them, et cetera, because they believe that Palestine should be free. Right. And they don't have the right to believe that. And so uh, I think it's really important to say that. And so what we're seeing is the whole world, the whole uh, uh, colonial mode of production is uh, under extraordinary stress right now. We see it in Nigeria. We see it in Mali, uh, where people are rising up. The colonizers are trying to move forward. See it and have been watching it for a long time in Venezuela, Cuba, uh, trying to complete this process uh, as a part of taking power over our own lives. This is a struggle against uh, against the colonialism. We see this struggle uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. We're not just people who are protesting. We're talking about black people must be free must be self-governing. That's what Indian colonialism is all about. That's what black power meant in 1966 that changed the character of the struggle of black people in this country from one just whining and begging, et cetera, and say, we want power, black power. That's an anti-colonial demand that put the demand of black people right on course uh, with the people's oppressed peoples around the world. And, and so I just think it's really important for us to say that we are at a different place now and the people have to have power. And you cannot say that the people can't have power because you don't like the leaders of the ones who are calling for power. You can't say you don't want black people to have power because you don't like Uhuru uh, 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 or something to that effect. Or you can say it, but you will be exposed as a consequence of, of things like this teaching that we're doing now. We want to take people beyond simply recognizing that this happened on this date, this happened on this date, but try to tie the whole thing together in terms of what we have to struggle against, we have to struggle against the colonial mode of production. You can't get to communism if that's what your interest is. You can't get to socialism if that's what your interest is uh, without destroying colonialism. The whole thing rests upon the foundation of colonialism. That's why we've said the road to socialism is painted wow. black, right? Uh, and that's, not, that's, that's what we are struggling for. So when we talk about socialism, uh, a new world. We are talking about a world where there are no slaves and slave masters. There are no there are no bosses and workers and things like that. That the whole world and we are arrogant enough to believe that we can make it happen, and that's part of what this teaching is about. So this is not a call uh, as such to 
uh, to denounce uh, Jews or to, de to, to uh, say uh, hooray for Hamas, except it represents uh, clearly the interests of the Palestinian people, uh, et cetera. This is uh, uh, helping us to identify uh, the essence of this contradiction that we are confronted with because it happens every day, every week, every year. There's a new this, a new that, et cetera, et cetera. And all of it comes from this, this uh, profound contradiction. I'm trying to uh, be expeditious here. Uh, uh, so uh, the Palestinians, uh, as it has been inferred, uh, uh, have are paying the price right now uh, for its internecine uh, kind of brutality uh, against Jews by Europeans who uh, never paid uh, a collect who have never paid a collective price for the Holocaust. Europe never paid a price for the Holocaust, never paid a price for the Holocaust. And now the Palestinians are paying the price for this contradiction that happened there. Uh, and this Holocaust has its origin uh, immediately anyway uh, uh, on the colonial uh, uh, mode of production. It's founding slavery of African people, the theft of land, the social system came from that. It's what created the Holocaust. Uh, even when you look at uh, the philosophy that come from uh, people uh, uh, like the Nazis, uh, uh, um, and it's which is similar to the philosophy coming from the Zionists. This protect this these these uh, special people, etc., uh, uh, for whom the rules don't apply. That applies to the rest of us because we are somehow special because we uh, these are special people, and we have to challenge that. Yeah. Uh, Jews are just human beings like the rest of us. Yeah. I refuse to join this notion that somehow these Jews are somehow a weird or different people that I hear coming from anti-Jewish folk and I hear I refuse to unite with that assumption coming from Jews. You just like everybody else. You understand? You take your chances just like everybody else. The same laws of society apply to Jews as they apply to Africans and everybody else. And so this whole notion of being this special people, et cetera, is bogus. And you know, they, they talk about God gave them, gave them uh, what they characterize as Israel now, uh, 4,000 years ago, that's worse than Paul McKees. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's a hell of a, he's a hell of a, 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 a slam, slum lord, landlord, et cetera. Uh, you know, so what kind of God is that just going around giving people their uh, territory, et cetera? So that's garbage. And uh, so I wanted to say that. And uh, uh, the, 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 the definition of Israel uh, Palestinian question as limited uh, to this specific uh, issue uh, is not acceptable. It's not acceptable. We, we don't accept that. And I'm sorry if it upsets anybody. I'm not really sorry. I'm hoping that it causes pause. I'm hoping that it causes pause. The objective here is to win people to a better understanding than what they have got from the colonizers, from the oppressors, that's Jews, that's other people uh, as well to have a better understanding to participate collectively in overturning social system of oppression and, and genocide. Yeah. Oppression and genocide, we wanna end that uh, and, and not salute it, uh, uh, et cetera. So, uh, and I, I wanna just reiterate, it's already been said, I say it again, because uh, they're talking about how this, uh, this this Hamas attack on this unprovoked attack uh, uh, on 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 Jews. Uh, uh, it, the fact is, Israel, uh, the very existence of Israel is a provocation. Yeah. You know, it's a prov Its very existence came uh, about uh, at the expense of the rights and, and and life of the Palestinian people. And there's an ongoing effort right now uh, to to make the Palestinians disappear. Even the so-called uh, uh, get out of town but, but in 24 hours, get out of the country in 24 hours. Uh, even the so-called corridor, that safety, is a part of the process to empty, empty uh, 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 Palestine of Palestinians, to get them to leave out of Palestine. And so now you have the Jewish state becoming and, and taking over the entire territory as they've been doing incrementally, uh, except they've had the contradiction having to deal with Palestinians in the country. So if they can push the Palestinians into Jordan, that's why Egypt is blocking the border, part of the reason why, because they don't want the Palestinians to have to come there. They want to keep, you know, that they, they want to, the, the, the Israeli state would push the Palestinians out of this territory, then it becomes a non-Palestinian territory, 
uh, just like Golan Heights and other places that they took all these territories and land. That, that's part of what it is uh, that we uh, are looking at and we reject that completely. And we asked, uh, we recognize the power of, of philosophy and that uh, Karl Marx is absolutely correct when he says that, uh, that uh, philosophy when it grips the masses becomes a material forces, force. And we've got uh, Jews who do have recognition in history of oppression uh, 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 and, and brutality, et cetera, and who've been offered uh, as an explanation, as a way out of this, this Zionist uh, uh, garbage that, I, I should not say garbage, uh, even though, uh, just because I'm trying to say it in a way that allows people to be able to hear what I'm saying, but it's, a, it's really misdirection. It's really a, a philosophy of imperialism, et cetera. And we want people to reject that, just like we reject uh, to the extent we are competent enough to do so, we reject all philosophy, imperialist philosophy. That's why we reject the whole notion that somehow uh, that this land that we are on, I'm talking now about the African People's Socialist Party anyway, uh, that somehow the land that we own now uh, is uh, 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 something uh, that, cause we, we were here first and it doesn't really belong to the indigenous people or the five states or, or the Black Belt South, et cetera, which regardless of our intentions, what it does is puts us in a, a trajectory that responsible for the condition of the indigenous people. Uh, part of the profound contradiction of the indigenous people is the theft of their land and, and everything that's being done to keep them from having their land. For me to join in and somehow claim the land, I've just joined with everybody who's who's with the white people, the powers that, that's, that's taking the land and keeping the people living under starvation and worse kinds of oppression. So we reject that. We unite with the, with the uh, indigenous people here and the struggle to reclaim their land and what have you. And we do so in full solidarity. We recognize this land is the land of the indigenous people. And I know, I believe, I'm confident that it's part of the process and what I know about the indigenous struggle anyway, that we got a place. Uh, as we, we earn that place as part of the struggle uniting with the indigenous people. I don't have any fear that I'm going to be evicted uh, by the indigenous people once we make this collective revolution. My eviction problem is, is right now in Redbud here uh, uh, in St. Louis. My eviction problem is, is Paul McKeese and all these people who, who are gentrifying our communities and things like that all around this country and much of the world. So... Uh, I just wanted to, 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 to make uh, those kinds of uh, statements and that Jews you know, have a responsibility like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And you have to reject Zionism, uh, uh, and, and which is simply another face, another characterization of colonial uh, imperial power. You reject that and join with the rest of us uh, uh, in struggling for our liberation. And that's the way to freedom. That's the way to life. That's the way, uh, unless you take down the, 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 what do you call those security bars and all those other things that you think can protect you from, uh, from uh, the, the, the fact that people want their freedom and want their resources back. Become one of the people and fight for the freedom and the resources as one of the people, as opposed to trying to stand outside of that and maintain this relationship with the with the uh, with the imperialists. So uh, I wanted to just go ahead and and say that and uh, uh, and express appreciation again uh, for this this really important teaching. And I think we have to try to do this as many times in many places as we can, so that we can inform people. And people won't always do what they have the information to do, but they can't do it unless they have the information. And that's what this is about, to provide information. And because there are even people who are in this discussion now uh, who know some of the dates and some of the facts that we're talking about, but I think we've helped them to connect the dates and the facts in a way that never before uh, has occurred. And African internationalism, which is a philosophy born out of the struggle of African people, uh, but it's applicable to all the colon all the people around the world. Because if it's, if it's philosophy, it don't just speak to the question of African people. A philosophy is something that uh, defines a one's relationship, place uh, 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 in the world, a uh, relationship in the world and, 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 and the future that we are looking for. And that's, that's a relationship we have with all the peoples on the planet Earth. And uh, as Africans, we can do that and have done that. And uh, so I just wanted to, to say that and to thank everybody for being here and all of this incredible uh, uh, presenters that's, that preceded me. Uh, so uh, Uhuru comrades. <laughs>
Uhuru. Uhuru Chairman. Uhuru wow. Chairman. Uhuru. Yes. Well, and just really want to just salute that brilliant, you know, presentation. I mean, and it was this analysis, African internationalism, which we know was is, you know, chairman is the author, the theoretician behind this theory that allowed us to even be able to sum up the situation in Palestine, um, you know, through this through this analysis, uh, the the correct explanation of, you know, how we got uh, to this place and, you know, what the whole struggle is about and how it's a, it's a whole global struggle that's happening. It's not just this thing isolate, isolated over in one region of the world, but it's something that we're all connected to uh, having been forcibly locked into the colonial mode of production. So as we've been saying from, since the beginning of this, the struggle of, in Palestine is our struggle. It's the, the struggle of all freedom loving people and especially that of colonized peoples. Um, so again, really want to salute the the uh, the brilliance, the leadership of Chairman Amalia Shatella, and um, also really want to appreciate everybody um, for tuning in with us um, again. And I want to uh, just make an announcement. Um, we're back up uh, now, but Comment. before you do, uh, Comment Akile, I, I think it's really important to say uh, about you know they they say that Palestine or Gaza was attacked because uh, they invaded. Uh, uh, Israel, uh, occupied Israel, um, et cetera. But the reality is they were, uh, we didn't use, we didn't have any hang gliders here in St. Louis. We had no hang gliders in St. Petersburg, Florida when they attacked our offices and buildings here. Uh, the fact is they attacked us because of colonialism. It's the colonial crisis that's, that's beating them up. The fact is that I want to make that point because uh, we're looking at the same thing when we see what happened on July 29th here when they brought armored vehicles and they, they cordon off entire African community, collective terror for the people so that the people would know not to be connected to an anti-colonial struggle. That was the assumption that they did it, that they, they, they were working from. So, uh, and we didn't use a single hang glider, we had, didn't have any, couldn't afford any, uh, didn't know where to get them, didn't know how to use them if we got them, uh, et cetera. So it was no hang gliders involved. It was just the ambition of our people to be free. And they attacked us because of that. In attacking us, they were attacking the African people here and attacking Palest uh, the Hamas as they they're attacking the Palestinian people. And the only reason they attack Hamas because Hamas is out in front. And the only reason they attacked the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru Movement is because we are out in front of the struggle for the liberation of our people. I just wanted to make that point. Uhuru. 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 Absolutely, <laughs> Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that intervention. Um, just really want to unite with that. Um, you know, being out in front and being out in front means being able to explain the world and put it right side up. And you, um, Chairman, as well as the African People's Socialist Party, you know, was, you know, born and with the intent with the objective uh, to be able to turn the world right side up by eliminating the colonial mode of production. So um, again, really salute your leadership and that profound uh, presentation that we just got. This has been such an incredible teach-in and it's uh, really important um, because I, as we mentioned earlier about the war of ideas and how you know um, we're not even allowed to have this discussion. First of all, um, if you have this discussion, you'll be rated at five o'clock in the morning, um, just like we were, You know, just to be able to express um, and to be able to sum this up, they don't want us to be able to have this discussion. They don't even want you to be able to have an analysis that comes close um, to you know, how the world actually is. So much so that uh, during this broadcast, um, Facebook and YouTube sabotaged our, um, our lives. Uh, we've restarted the lives now, but we've you know, redirected people to come onto the Zoom, but they basically, we were able to hear uh, the presentations, but they had it frozen on one screen um, for, uh, uh, over 30 minutes or so. And people were still watching because they just wanted to hear, you know, what was being stated, but that's just the links that this system will go to. And it's, you know, it's control over, you know, every um, platform of uh, idea, you know, distri um, information distribution, you know, being uh, trying to block out the ability uh, for people to be able to see something, hear something that does give them pause, even if they can't even immediately unite with it, but it gives them you know, the opportunity to see and, and, and hear something totally different from that of which they've, you know, had to, you know, be bombarded with their entire lives. So uh, this is the future and, you know, they, they, they can't keep us underground. So just 
really want to appreciate this powerful teaching. And I know, uh, as, uh, Chair Mways, that we want to, um, because we are raising resources, we have a $500 goal uh, for today. So before transitioning into our next um, uh, speaker, which we're very excited to have uh, all of our speakers, um, I know that we want to just do a little announcement about uh, where we are and, and how much we've got to go. Yes, thank you so much. And just want to join you in saluting and just this entire uh, teaching and the opportunity for us to be able to, as we say, take up all the democratic space and just providing the ideological, you know, clarity that we can make a conscious decision about, about how we forward this, um, this fight back. And so, you know, we are calling on people to support this fight back, um, hands off of who fight back coalition. We have a goal today of raising 500 and I wanna appreciate those who have already gone uh, to handsoffwhohoo.org to donate. I wanna thank uh, Comrade Amanda with their $100 donation. I wanna appreciate uh, Carpani Burns with your $20 donation and MQ, MQ for $15. And that takes us, we have raised 135. So we wanna appreciate those who have um, already, you know, heeded the call and we're gonna check back in later on. So. I will turn it back to Director Akile um, as we introduce our next uh, special uh, guest for, for today. And again, you are here for the Free Free Palestine teaching, and we are on YouTube and on Facebook. I wanted to say that again. You can go back, and this is where you can get the recording as well. Uhuru. Uhuru. So as we um, go into our next speaker, I just think that it's important to note, you know, especially some of the things that the chairman said, but what we what we see happening in Palestine and the history around the occupation of Palestine that you know in terms of uh, where it is that they've learned they learned how to you know create and form an illegitimate settler colony you don't have to look any farther than what it is that they've done to what's now called North America what's called Canada what's called the United States and you know stolen Mexico you know all of the this this land this territory that has a new name new new definition imposed on it by colonizers. But pr prior to, you know, this Ill illegitimate settler colony, um, uh, there, there was a people that existed here that had civilization here and still exist, but live in these, um, uh, uh, in, in these reser what's called reservations, which are actually concentration camps, which are these open air prisons uh, that we've compared to uh, the, the conditions of, of Palestinians in occupied Palestine. So um, to, you know, to be able to speak you know, with regard to that and the whole, um, and also uh, just a real like astute, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, teacher around counterinsurgency. We have um, Comrade Ward Churchill with us today um, to, you know, offer a few words uh, to this teaching. So want to go ahead and welcome up a comrade and really uh, appreciate, salute your participation here today. Very honored to, to have you on with us. So um, let's bring up Comrade Ward Churchill. Hello, my relatives. I introduced you in Lakota, but not because I am Lakota, but because it's quite germane to where I would like to begin my remarks. But first, you know, my commendations on the content, the quality of the presentations in this teaching thus far. A lot of what I was going to say has already been said, but maybe I'll take a different angle on it. In any case, I'm supposed to address the relationship between the Palestinian liberation struggle and indigenous people on this land, Lakotas, and 400 odd indigenous nations within the US 48 states, portion of what they call North America. There's hundreds more north of that artificial boundary that they drew, creating what they call Canada. And there's more in Alaska, the Aleutian Islands. And the U.S., since it um, has reached across water to encompass its uh, claimed home territoriality, you've got the Kanakamali and the Hawaiian Islands and areas that they grab called American Samoa or Guam with the Chamorros. So you've got Samoans and you've got Chamorros and you've got others as well. The best that I have ever heard it put was back in 1982 when the Israeli Defense Force, so-called, 
was fighting a more or less conventional war with the Palestine Liberation Organization based largely at that time in Lebanon. And they'd driven north and laid siege to PLO leadership, many of its fighters in Beirut. But this created a problem because they needed a negotiating partner to resolve this. And ultimately, the Zionist in charge determined that the only negotiating partner that they could conceive of would be Yasser Arafat. And Yasser Arafat was besieged in Beirut. They couldn't call off the siege of Beirut, but they needed some place for Arafat to go so he would not be killed or worse, captured in this process. And at that time, American Indian movement, and I was a participant in this, was engaged in an occupation of a chunk of territory just outside of Rapid City, South Dakota, in the Black Hills, the Hisapa, sort of the crux point, central point of um, territorial meaning, for lack of a better way to put it, spiritually important, very important to the Lakota people. We were in the process of trying to reclaim that under provision of the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. We had a law on our side. They had numbers. And of course, has been discussed by virtually every speaker today. They had firepower on their side. But we were hanging. This was a three-year continuous occupation by a main force and then several years beyond that by a group that uh, was left to maintain the area that we had uh, seized and held. But there was a press conference being held with regard to the land occupation in Rapid City in the middle of all this that was going on in Beirut, Lebanon the quest to find some place for Arafat and PLO leadership to be relocated to. Ultimately, that turned out to be Tunisia. But Russell Means, who was pretty much the head man in the Yellow Thunder camp occupation in Black Hills, we had named the site when Kayan's ETO spy, Yellow Thunder community, actually, rather than camp, but it appears in the press as Yellow Thunder camp. So I use that term. In the middle of uh, the questioning from AP, UP, all the reporters that were gathered for press conference, which was to be about the situation with our occupation and where we were going, what our plans were, blah, blah, blah. Somebody asked about the situation in Lebanon and that conflict there. And Russ Means, very much on point, said the Palestinians of North America offer sanctuary at Yellow Thunder Camp to the American Indians of the Middle East. That defines the nature of that relationship about as well as I believe it's possible for it to be defined. And what's going on and has been going on in Palestine, the colonial beachhead, as Jabotonsky once referred to it, the colonial beachhead for European penetration and control in the Middle East on a long-term basis is virtually identical, point by point. Now, the demographics are wildly different. The technology is considerably different than what it was at the onset here. But what's been referred to as the mode of production, the mode, which goes beyond production, 
the mode of relationality that's involved. And if you will, the philosophy of white superiority, white supremacy, white domination, colonialism, all the rest of this is virtually interchangeable. And the methods that are used and the rationales that are used historically here, as well as contemporary in contemporary terms and that have been used by the colonial settler state of Israel since the initiation of its project, which really predates 1948 and isn't really consummated until 1949 with the expansion beyond what it was, it was supposed to comprise territorially speaking. There was an expansion involved in the NACBA. It wasn't simply clearing of the land as we were cleared from the land to make way for the superior breeding stock and the superior self-anointedly superior utilization of our land base here, the Nakba wasn't simply the clearing of Palestinians from land and community and way of life within what the UN had signed as the territoriality of the newly founded state of Israel. It was an expansion of that state right there from the get-go. And it's been that process ever since. Just as the Palestinians have been living in internment camps, refugee camps is a term they use. Ever since that happened, 75 years, you find exactly a parallel to that in not simply the reservations, although that would be adequate, but like at Fort Snelling, this was actual, you could call it accurately a concentration camp that was established for the Santee Dakotas as they were being cleared, having been starved into a state of warfare, their resistance. The army overpowered them, put them in concentration camp, held them there. You had a mass execution of the leadership and then a removal to even worse conditions, a place called Cherry Creek in the Dakota Territory, totally removed from their homeland. And no particular right of return has ever arisen. That's what was happening in South Dakota in 1982 when the war in Lebanon was occurring, was that we had won under colonial law, law, excuse me, under colonial law, it was found that the Black Hills had been wrongly taken from the Lakotas, clear back in 1877. And they offered compensation. They assigned compensation. They assigned 40 cents per acre for the territory taken. And the Lakotas refuse it. This is, according to U.S. government data, the most impoverished group of all groups identified by census in North America, the Lakotas in the Sioux complex of reservations. And they refuse to accept payment at that rate, or at any rate, or so, so they said at the time, for the Hisapa. So the Supreme Court went back and reconsidered and offered 5% simple interest accruing since the time of taking. And it came out to $110 million or something like that, which in 1982 is a lot of money. And they did a referendum on that too, and they refused that as well, which point the Supreme Court now administered justice. You never wanted to sell your property. We took it. We've acknowledged the theft, but you cannot have your land back, which is the only thing you were specifying would be justice, return of the stolen property. No, you have to accept compensation. You have to accept 
compensation from the party that stole the land. So they placed it in an escrow account in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the whole amount of money that the Lakotas had refused, and it's been sitting there gathering interest ever since. Like the Palestinians, the Lakotas remain among the most impoverished people in all of North America. They still refuse to accept payment for property they never wished to sell. Not property in a Lockean sense, but property in a completely different sense that has to do with their responsibility and relationality to the land and to others. A radically different view of how the world should work from that of the colonizer. They continue to refuse to accept the premise that they're ever going to sell Hisapa. And its slogan is the Black Hills are not for sale. Not then, not now, not ever. There's something to be learned from that. This has to do with the ways that the United States has self-justified, entitled itself to exercise a proprietary interest and jurisdiction over its own land base, identical if you think about it, to what's happening in Palestine to the Palestinians at the hands of the Zionist entity that controls. It's a bloody situation that has emerged, but it's no bloodier than the situation that has existed really since the foundation of the Israeli state. The other piece of this has to do with the utilization of labor to develop the land, as they call it, which is to say, destroy the natural balance of the land, the environment, and so on. And that's where the importation of African slave labor came in dispossession of indigenous owners, reduction of indigenous population, displacement of indigenous population, and the impression of black labor taken from the indigenous societies of Africa with devastating genocidal effect there to create the entity that seems to be by and large considered natural and inevitable sort of hegemonic condition we've got to unpack the whole thing see relations not only among ourselves but with the environment in a way that conforms to the value systems and understandings of the indigenous peoples who inhabit reside within the various points not only in the u.s and canada but around the world, because this was a global process and it's an ongoing process. Get it down to the point where, as Chairman O'Malley and everybody else has said all day long, each people is, as is stated in law, rhetorically, is free to exercise its rights, its responsibilities within their customary territory. There is a place for all relatives within that. Chairman O'Malley was correct that in fighting this through to its logical, logical conclusion where colonization in all forms has been repealed, retired to what Trotsky called the dustbin of history, there's a place for everyone so long as they do not attempt reassert this sort of colonial economic social and political order in any of its forms and i think probably i've spoken about as long 
as the time allotted to me. So I thank you all for listening. Oh, Doc Wells. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ward. I think, uh, as we know, this is there's never enough time to really go through it in depth. But I just want to really appreciate how, um, where you began, even with your presentation about, um, and this speaks to who we'll be introducing next. But that the political, um, as Union del Barrio says, their political south, you know, their political work is even south of the border. And for you, you know, ex you know, from Alaska to Chile. You know, we are experiencing settler colonialism here on this land and, yes. and it's different than what we see anywhere. And so I just really want to appreciate you for um, speaking to that aspect of this fight back. And we're so glad that you're here with us today. And uh, we have um, an exciting uh, panel of others who are going to help us continue to deepen this and to share their statements of solidarity with the resistance of the Palestinian people. So. Uh, thank you, and, and we hope you stay with us. We have some questions in the chat that we hope to address later on in our program. So, Director- I will have to leave in a few minutes, but- Okay, well, we'll know you'll be back and we know we'll see you. <laughs> yes, Uhuru. Uhuru, right on. Thank you, Professor Ward. Uhuru, Uhuru. Uhuru. Thank you for coming on. Yes, Uhuru. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, yeah. Chair, are you ready to introduce yeah. our next? Yeah, we could go ahead and move. I do want to see if we do have an update on um, fundraising, but maybe I'll throw that in after our next. So we can keep okay. Yeah. Okay. I think it would be important. Uh, I'm sorry that the ward is left because I would really like for us to consider uh, transcribing and coming up with a package from this, this yeah. teach in yeah. that we can make accessible to all kinds of people everywhere. So, uh, and uh, oh, I am not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think that would be really good. I think we've got an extraordinary piece of teaching equipment. If we can come out of here with a pamphlet booklet yeah. or something, I think we should consider that. I know we'll probably do some more of these, but uh, um, we can take this stuff. I think it's, it's potent. So, Uhuru, thank you. All right. Is that all right with you, Ward? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Splendid. Splendid. <laughs> Uhuru. Uhuru. Yes, I mean, yeah. it would definitely be important to have all of this in paper form, especially considering all of the interference we've even experienced up to now. So be able to disseminate this, you know, out on the ground, um, these incredible presentations that we you won't be able to find just walking into a library or, you know, mm -hmm. to a local place to get a paper or something like that. So really salute all of the incredible presentations we've had. And of course, again, want to salute Professor Ward Churchill. Uh, for coming on and, um, you know, providing that very important history, um, you know, to this discussion, the context that's necessary, you know, and the fact that, again, none of us live in isolation, we live in the world. And, you know, so everything that we are experiencing right now, we're directly connected to have some kind of responsibility to. Um, and, you know, this is allowing us to see what that responsibility is. And um, so to, to welcome up um, our next speaker, um, is a comrade um, who is not just a city councilman representing East New York. Um, he's also the leader of Operation Power and also a revolutionary, and that is a comrade Charles Barron, um, who is here to provide his um, a statement in support of the struggle in Palestine and with the struggle of all colonized people. So, Huru, uh, comrade brother Charles Barron, welcome to the program. We are well, Huru, comrades, I'm very excited about today's program. Uh, you, this is a great time to be alive. We're witnessing a worldwide revolution. Um, Palestine is in the limelight today, but look at Africa. Don't take your eyes off Africa, particularly in the Sahel region. When you look at what's happening in Burkina Faso, what's happening in uh, Chad even, what's happening in Niger, what's happening in Mali, we're seeing all of that. And then the BRIC conference that happens in South Africa, where nations are coming together and say no to the International Monetary Fund, no to the World Bank, no to the British pound, no to the European Euro, no to the American dollar. So when you see all of that going on, you know that we in the midst of a worldwide revolution and this that occurred in Palestine is just an example 
of what's to come. So I'm excited that I'm glad that I'm alive in these times and we're in the middle of it. I want to say to the African People's Socialist Party that uh, we have been blessed by your continued, consistent, uh, revolutionary fervor in the struggle for over 70 years. And we did uh, present to the New York City Council. And, you know, the City Council in New York is a, 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 a tough nut to crack but we did present our hands off the Uhuru movement resolution to 51 council members. It's in committee now, and we're going to see to it that we get a hearing on it and have the chairman uh, come and speak at the hearing by way of video or person, however he chooses. So we're very, very excited about that. We got a, a Cuban resolution passed in the city council and uh, saying that Cuba should be taken off the so-called terrorist list and the embargo should be lifted. And we got a chance to meet with the president from uh, uh, Cuba and have that re resolution actually pass the city council of the 51 uh, council members. We were able to get 45 of them to uh, support and pass that resolution. So as we look at all of this that's going on and we look at what has happened in the Gaza and what's happening recently, we have to be excited about revolution. It's on fire all over the country and looking at the, the chaos that the American government is in and almost shut down, open up, shut down. Somebody called me up, one of the media people in New York said, well, how do you feel about um, these old Republicans and messing up and they may shut down the government. I said, well, the government been shut down to us. It never opened up. And this is why we need a revolution to make sure that it radically changes the system we live under. So it'll be open for us and the people of oppressed communities all over the world. So I'm excited about that. I um, want to read a statement on our position here in New York. But bear in mind, as I read this statement, I'm reading it to get 51 council members to accept it. And these 51 council members, they visit Israel all the time with the speaker and mayor. They don't go to any other place. These are pro-Israeli uh, council members. These are council members that most of them are crying for what happened in Israel. and. Some of us, if we come up with language that's soft, you get called anti-Semitic. And I hope one day we have a, cuss, a discussion and a history lesson on who are the Semites? Who are the real Jews of the Bible? Uh, they were black and the folk that are in Israel now, they're European converts to Judaism. They are not the Jews of the Bible. And why? is it that everywhere these people have gone, um, they were persecuted and they weren't welcomed. So when Europe had their problems with this Jewish community and the Ergen and others were blowing up hotels and killing Tommies, uh, European police, London police, then Lord Balfour, Balfour said, look, get them out of our here and let's go on and send them to Palestine. They wanted to take Uganda or Argentina a homeland for the Jews, but they went behind Lord Balfour and the power of British imperialism and colonialism and fought off the Ottomans before that and then took over uh, Palestine ever since. So this resolution that I'm going to read to you or this language, you know, if it was read, if, it was, if I wrote it just for us, it would be very, very different. But I want you to keep in mind that this is a city council that, is, that has considered me an anti-Semite and the ADL has a whole dossier on everything I've ever said. And, and so this resolution was put in language to get some of my colleagues to be supportive. And some of them have, and some of them, uh, and I'm still getting beat up for something like this that ain't even as strong as I normally uh, would do in trying to pull them in. So bear that in mind. Let me be very clear. The attack on Israel by Hamas on October 7th, 2023 was not 
quote, an unprovoked attack. It was inevitable and must be put into historical context and cannot be used as a justification for escalating the continuing genocide against the Palestinian people. This was for my team there in, in, in the city council because they're afraid. Let me state unequivocally that I've always deplored any intentional killing of innocent non-combatant women and children and men in any theater of war anywhere in the world, including the Middle East. The road to so-called peace in the so-called Middle East can be achieved if the international community calls for the apartheid Israel government to end colonialism, wanted to put apartheid and colonialism together because some of them are really only on racism. They can't handle colonialism, but this is my way of getting them transitioned to colonialism as an analysis. The government to end its decades long colonization and illegal immoral occupation of Palestine, Palestinian land since the Balfour Declaration in 1917. The international community must support the right of Palestinian refugees who were forcibly displaced from their land to return to their homes. From the Englishman Lord Balfour's declaration in 1917 to support the Jewish people in establishing a national homeland in Palestine to the Nakba catastrophe where 700,000 to 800,000 Palestinians were displaced from their homes in 1947 to establish a Jewish state in 1948 to the present. Tens of thousands of innocent Palestinian women and children and men have been killed by Israeli forces. In 2014, a United Nations report documented that in the attack on the Gaza Strip, the Israeli Defense Force killed 1,523 Palestinians, which included 509 children, Earlier this year, before the October 7th attack, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Donald Trump of the Middle East, and his fascist right-wing government annexed more settlements in the West Bank, killing over 239 Palestinians, and 40 of them were children. The armed Jewish civilian settlers participated in the killings, according to international support. So when they say that innocent civilians are being killed in Israel, these civilians are armed settlers, many of them, that participated in the killing of Palestinian people and the theft of their land. The United States for decades has supplied the state of Israel with billions of dollars worth of arms <clears throat> to continue the occupation of Palestine and Palestinian land. For over 16 years, Israel has imposed an illegal blockade on Gaza. Nothing comes in by land, sea, or air. No food, no electricity, no fuel. The blockade did not start as a reaction to this last attack. This madness must stop. How much blood must be spilled before the world unites to end the occupation of Palestine by Israel? Free Palestine. And we feel that this statement along with some other stuff that we can at least open up their minds to, can perhaps win over some of our backward thinking blacks and, and whites and so-called socialist progressives. It is pathetic. You know, people talk all of this stuff, but once they get in there. So in the belly of the beast, I got to develop language that can move them to where we are in this even this, they said, was the most radical revolution, everything they ever heard. I'm anti-Semitic. I hate Jews. I'm anti-this and anti-Black. I said, first of all, you are not the Semites. Semites are us, and I can never be anti-me. So I don't even want to hear no anti-Semitism. And rather than do that, let's have some intellectual open debate on the issue instead of just calling me an anti-Semite so you don't have to deal with the truth because you can't handle it. So I had the um, opportunity in 2009 to go to Palestine, to the Gaza Strip. I'll never forget Gil Noble, one of the um, great journalists of the great program, Like It Is, here in New York. Uh, he was just so worried about me going to uh, uh, Palestine, to the Gaza Strip. But I went with Cynthia McKinney and to one whom you all are very familiar with, 
uh, Brother Matulu from Dead Prayers. And we went over there with George Galloway. He was a, um, a pilot. A uh, whole oh, bunch of stuff I would have liked to gotten in there. but He was in the parliament. Say that again. Oh, he was in the parliament um, of um, London. So when we got there, we had to pass through the, the border of Rafa, the place that they sealing off now. And this is significant to mention because they're saying, get out of there because we're going to blow up everything. Go where? The only place is to go through that border, Rafa, which we have problems getting through. The, the uh, Egyptian army met us at the border, and um, I had to go back and negotiate with the foreign minister in Cairo of Egypt to get us to go through. And he finally said, okay, uh, we're nervous because Israel's nervous about y'all, but y'all can bring the, the aid through, but only in 24 hours. When we got in there, the place was like, oh man, like imperialist war, World War II. It was devastated, rubble. So what we see seeing now is what we was already happening there. They already didn't have uh, food and water. I mean, this was in 2009, and even before that, it's been what the place was blown to to bits and nothing but rubble all over the place. And we met with the Palestinian people and gave the aid. But this has been a long-standing struggle, and now with their attempts to probably level the Gaza Strip, there's no way they could win this war. No way they're going to win. When you look at the whole world, it's going to flip. They start off with their propaganda machines getting support from the world, but then the world is flipping on them. And a lot of resolutions over the years have been passed against them in the United Nations and the America vetoed a lot of those resolutions. So this is going to be a major defeat for the colonial state of Israel. This is the final days of their domination, the final days of the domination of colonialism and the colonial mode of production all over the world, in Africa and Asia and Latin America, you're gonna see a real strong revolutionary comeback of these forces all over the world. And I'm just glad to be a part of the Uhuru movement here in the belly of the beast. We're gonna win, we're gonna win our case. And when we win our case, because they did this, we're going to be known even all greater all over the world, the chairman and, and all of the comrades that are fighting this good fight. So this is a great time to be alive. It's a sad time for the bloodshed and for the so many lives that's going to be lost. But we're witnessing the birth pains of a new age, of a new society, of new governments coming into place. And we here in the belly of the beast going to play a major role in the final defeat, putting the final nail in the coffin of domestic colonialism, of global colonialism all over the world, and the liberation of our people. We're going to be witnessing this in our lifetime. Uhuru, comrades. Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you, uh, Councilman Charles Barron. And you know, what a great example of um, what it looks like to take on the, the colonial question and to be a revolutionary in any aspect and place where we are. And I just really want to salute your work as, um, as you mentioned, the two resolutions that you've put forth and that we will make them have to listen um, to the people. Um, and I just want to salute you for just bringing it there. And um, we look forward to hearing from you and seeing Operation Power on the ground in Washington, D.C., and Uhuru, thank you, Councilman Charles Barron, and Black Power. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Uhuru. All right, so um, comrades, uh, I just wanna really just take a moment to acknowledge those who have gone to handsoffuhuru.org slash donate. Um, I wanna, and we're gonna formally thank these uh, recent donors later, but I wanna just salute Leah Matum, Deputy Chair Ona Zanei Eshetela, um, who is the, uh, uh, the architect behind the Black Power Blueprint on the ground in St. Louis, Kat, as well as Sam and Becky, who went to handsoffuhuru.org and are helping us 
to, um, you know, and I see another pledge in the chat here from Angelica. Thank you so much, Angelica. Comrades, we are on our way to making this fight back, um, you know, happen on, on, on every aspect of this. So I just want to salute you, comrades, and I want to bring up our next speaker. Um, and to, you know, one thing we have always said around the um, importance of recognizing the righteous struggle for the indigenous people of this land is, is the relation of the, the relationships that we have as colonized people in the struggle for our own national liberation, for our own liberation struggles. And um, the uh, struggle of, for, um, you know, La Raza can be expressed through this work of Union del, del Barrio. And I just really wanna salute um, Undersecretary Benjamin uh, Prado, who is here with us on the call uh, to deliver a statement in solidarity with Palestine and the Mexican indigenous liberation struggle, which will see itself to the end. Venceremos and welcome, comrade. All right, Uhuru, comrades. You know, first of all, I really want to appreciate, you know, this teaching, the significance of it, the historical moment that we're in, that we're living, uh, really uh, pulling the anti-colonial fight back, right, front and center. So I really want to appreciate this. Uh, number two, you know, I'm really honored uh, to be on uh, with all the distinguished comrades that preceded me, uh, you know, for Unión del Barrio since our founding in 1981, you know, we have expressed our support and solidarity with all oppressed peoples around the world uh, in the right to resist, in the right to fight back against settler colonialism. And we express our solidarity with the bold resistance of the Palestinians, you know, who are on their land uh, waging uh, a, a struggle uh, to really defeat the, the Israeli terrorist state, the settler colonial state, uh, you know, and as Mexicans, uh, an organization uh, based in California, you know, for over 40 years, we have struggled for the self-determination of the Mexicano indigenous people within the political borders of the United States. And it's important to lay out that we recognize ourselves as indigenous peoples, that in fact, it was colonialism, settler colonialism that invaded our lands, that created this, this war, uh, settler colonial war under the same premises of somehow, you know, uh, uh, white people being the chosen people under this uh, terrible doctrine of manifest destiny. And it is all right to uh, resist settler colonialism. And, uh, you know, we say uh, this past week, we recognize the importance of indigenous resistance uh, because there's a lot of uh, now even talk about recognizing indigenous people's day. But what we recognize is the indigenous people's right to resist every single day to confront uh, the horrendous policies of settler colonial terror on our own land uh, who, and, and the slanderous uh, speak that uh, the media uh, moves forward by saying that somehow we're illegal aliens on our own land. We reject those concepts and we that, and we reaffirm our right to exist on our lands, uh, to reclaim our lands, to reclaim our resources, to reclaim the value of our labor so that we can live with freedom on our own land as dignified people as well. We condemn the normalized violence and terror that the Israeli state has inflicted against the people of Palestine. We reject the false notion that Israel is simply defending itself. A colonizer state can never claim self-defense while on stolen land. As an organization, we reject and denounce all forms of state terrorism uh, because we recognize and we have must say that we are diametrically opposed in the worldview that both the Israeli settler state as well as the US colonial settler state have on this question of terrorism because it was not the Palestinians who dropped bombs on Hiroshima or Nagasaki. It was not the Palestinians who uh, kidnapped African people and terrorized them to come here and work as slaves on the plantations. It was not the Palestinians who uh, invaded uh, Mexican indigenous lands. Uh, it was not the Palestinians who created these political uh, borders uh, now currently uh, that divide uh, our, our homeland. We know who the real terrorists are, those that occupy our land, those who daily attack our people, those who daily incarcerate children. And you can see it very clearly, even on this colonial border here that we uh, that we see where young children are, are forced 
to live in in, in conditions of uh, complete uh, destitution. And we we reject the notion that somehow you know the Palestinians fighting back against settler colonialism are somehow uh, acts of terror. Uh, moreover, we are unapologetically uphold we un unapologetically uphold the right of colonized people to engage in anti-colonial armed struggle to defend themselves and to defend their absolute right to, to exist. We denounce US imperialism as represented by those uh, political parties, uh, two political parties that are in consensus when it comes to imperialism, when it comes to attacking people around the world to steal their resources. And we salute our Jewish comrades who have bravely taken the righteous position of opposing the racist ideology known as Zionism and this Israeli oppression of the Palestinian people. You know, beginning in 1492, colonizers attacked native peoples, murdered millions, stole our lands, and since 1845, U.S. settler colonialism has invaded Mexico and stolen our land as well. And today, you know, uh, when we see the history as brilliantly uh, uh, laid out by Comrade Achille, you know, the 1848 Israeli settlers attacked Palestinians and stole the majority of their land and established this uh, settler colonial state. We've seen the consequences of Israeli occupation suffered by Palestine, suffered by the Palestinians, uh, and it's that same oppressive colonial uh, uh, system that currently occupies our barrios. It, it is not lost upon us that uh, the United States sends its its occupying army in the form of the police, in the form of border patrol, in the form of ICE to get trained by the Israeli military. Uh, they practice that occupation. They see it the way it's carried out in Palestine, and then they bring it here into our barrios, into our ghettos, into onto the colonial border here, uh, uh, trained by by the Israeli uh, settler colonizing forces to inflict that same settler colonialism on us. Right, and we see the same corporations in the form of Elbit Systems, uh, Eta North America, Qit Corporation, or the Magal Security Systems. All these technology weapons used uh, to monitor, to track, to oppress our communities are are the same ones that uh, you know were and have been uh, created in the, in the occupied. Palestinian territories and used against Palestinians. So Union del Barrio stands with the people of Palestine and with the righteous struggle for self-determination and the right to return to the illegally occupied lands. The bold resistance of the Palestinian people is understood as such by billions of people around the world. And we are confident that justice will prevail in Palestine. We unite with the vast majority of people across the world who support the Palestinian struggle for self-determination and self-determination is the highest expression of democracy. And so for us, you know, free all, we say self-determination for the, for the people of Palestine, viva la lucha palestina, from Palestine to Mexico, all these colonial walls uh, will go and must go. Uh, and as many of the Palestinians have already expressed, you know, and we express it too, Es mejor vivir de pie que vivir de rodillas. You know, it's better to fight on your feet than to live uh, your life on your knees. Tierra y libertad, victory to the Palestinian resistance. Uhuru. 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 Salute, comrade Benjamin Prado of the Union del Barrio, the Mexican Liberation Organization. Really appreciate you, comrade, for being on with us and just a profound uh, statement, but not just a statement, practical unity with the struggle of colonized and oppressed peoples all around the world, including um, the, you know, the long relationship and, uh, you know, just, yeah, the long relationship with the African People's Socialist Party and the African Revolution. Thank you so much for um, joining us today. And, you know, just want to acknowledge that at the same time, the U.S. is funneling, you know, more and more uh, 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 resources that should be paid and reparations to African people, um, you know, uh, as they send these resources over to fund, um, you know, the attack on Palestine through Israel. Um, uh, Joe Biden also um, uh, is, it, you know, already proceeded with a process to extend this border wall to keep um, uh, Mexican people uh, from being able to come back in onto their own land. This is all happening at the same exact time. And, you know, so I think that those kind of profound contradictions have to be raised as a part of, you know, the, the struggle that we're making that, you know, there is the, the struggle of the colonized and there's a the struggle of the colonizer and there's no straddling the fence. 
you know, in this case that the colonized are determined to be free and the colonizer has done everything in its power to ensure that uh, uh, colonized people will never know their freedom. But as it's been expressed today, uh, we will win and we are winning. And um, something that was really important that uh, Comrade Benjamin just noted was that it's billions of people around the world you know, who do not, um, you know, in some way uh, have, you know, unity, do not have unity with, you know, the colonial mode of production and whether or not it's, you know, acknowledged as such a, a, a such a, you know, um, an obvious kind of, um, you know, recognition that this is the colonial mode of production. But the fact is that there are more of us throughout the world, colonized, exploited, and oppressed peoples throughout the world who have suffered under the boot of the colonial mode of production of the colonizer, you know, who are struggling to change that world. And we've always been characterized as some kind of minority, as if it's like the minority opinion and as if we're some small groups. And part of how they've achieved that is, you know, um, you know, picking us up and, you know, taking us all and, you know, dispersing us all throughout the world or expelling us from our land and creating a situation where we have to move um, as refugees into other places or, or, you know, carving up our lands and redefining us as something else, even though we're one people. And this is something, a project that's extended all across the globe. And uh, just to, to, to bring, you know, to, to help relay this point, I want to welcome up our next speaker, who is uh, Comrade Alize, a solidarity officer with Anik Bayan, the Filipino, um, uh, the Filipino um, revolutionary organization, you know, and um, also in Anik Bayan, San Diego, who is on the ground in San Diego as this teaching is happening with other comrades. So I want to welcome Comrade Alize. Thank you for joining us. Uhuru. Uhuru, comrades. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Alize. Um, I'm Nicaraguan American. And so through, you know, my own family history of like leaving our homeland because of US imperialism, um, this hits really deep for home. And as solidarity officer in Anakbayan, really seeing how all of our histories are really connected and how we really need to like link and raise how the structure of imperialization and colonization really have affected those in Palestine as well. Um, so we stand with you as Anak Bayan San Diego, a chapter of the of the organization Anak Bayan USA and the Alliance member of Bayan USA. As militant youth fighting for genuine democracy in the Philippines, we salute the continued valiant and coordinated efforts of the Palestine people struggling to be free against the state which claims to be invincible. The Al-Aqsa flood is a statement to the strength of the people united against their colonizers and is an inspiration to liberation movements around the world. We support the just Palestinian struggle for self-determination, liberation, and return against Zionist violence and occupation. We have a shared struggle with the Palestine people against US imperialism and fascism. We condemn former Philippine president Duterte for his remarks on Gaza, saying that he would make Gaza the world's biggest cemetery. As we grieve, we also refuse to see overseas Filipinos workers as a pawn in an international conflict. Over 2 million Filipinos work in the Middle East and the overseas workers have been killed. However, their loss is not a result of the Palestinians' freedom struggle, but it is an outcome of state terrorism and neglect. Filipino migrants are victims of a terrorist state. They are in Israel because the Philippine government has systematized their migration abroad, displacing them from their homes and neglected to care for them as they fight exploitation, discrimination, and outright violence. As we command, as we demand consular services for all overseas workers and Philippine nationals, we have only been met with further surveillance. We call on our fellow Filipinos and all people to join in support for the Palestinian cause. We will continue the fight against US imperialism and support and its support of the Zionist Israeli state. And we will stand ready to share the truth, to join in protest and action, and to celebrate the resistance of the Palestinians in Gaza, across occupied Palestine, and all across the world. Uhuru, comrades. Thank you. Uhuru. Uhuru.
Uhuru, Uhuru Comrade Alize, thank you so much for being here and sharing this statement from Anik Bayan, um, the Filipino Liberation Organization. And I know um, you're right there on the ground representing Anik Bayan in uh, San Diego. And just really appreciate also just the profound support that Anik Bayan has extended, you know, to, you know, this struggle as a part of the Hands Off Uhuru Fight Back Coalition as well. And, you know, just really excited to have all of these forces, all these forces recognizing, uh, rec um, uh, reflecting, sorry, the colonized and oppressed of the world um, at the Black People's March on the White House on November 4th. So Uhuru, uh, salute to you, Alizé and, and Anik Bayan. And, um, I will uh, go ahead. We have a couple of more speakers today, comrades. It's just been very powerful. You see these comrades here, rep, you know, rec, uh, again, representing different places throughout the world, you know, in different uh, struggles that are all uh, not different struggles, but, you know, different, um, you know, peoples, you know, representing one struggle against one colonial mode of production and that it's erupting, it's unfolding all throughout the world. And, you know, such as it's been expressed today, it's such an exciting time, an important period in history we are witnessing, but not just watching it from the sidelines, actively apart. And uh, so I'm going to uh, turn it back over uh, to St. Louis at the Uhuru House, where we have uh, comrade Zaki Baroudi joining us. The, Zaki Baroudi is the president general of the Universal African People's Organization, a leader right there on in the ground on in St. Louis, Missouri. Also, you know, has uh, been a strategic force use, utilizing the electoral arena as well to bring these politics you know, inside, um, you know, this this space that's uh, ordinarily dominated, you know, by the colonizer and, you know, its henchmen. Um, so welcome, Comrade Zaki Brudi. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, thank you. Um, Assalamu alaikum, Yohuru. Let me say on behalf of the Universal African People's Organization, we stand shoulder to shoulder with the Palestinian cause, and we speak uh, forcefully against the uh, occupiers uh, of Zionism in the state of uh, Palestine, also called uh, Israel. Let me just say today has been a extraordinary day for myself personally. I've just come from a, here in St. Louis, a press conference that was called by the camp, uh, National Campaign for Human Dignity. And at the press conference, although there was a little slight differences on our position and their position as relates to how we see Israel in this entirety, there were several key points that were made that we are in total support of. And I'm sure many of the speakers prior to me are in support of those positions as first of all, it has to be a rallying cry across the globe to end the blockade, supply of water, food, fuel, medicine, and electricity to the uh, civilians in Gaza. Also, it should be an immediate sensation of the hostilities and bombardment that's taking place daily in upon the people of Gaza, as well as it should be an immediate sensation of the Israeli government to push to expel the more than 2 million Palestinians from their birthplace, Gaza. But also let me just say our organization, I'm proud to say, we're part of a force that was organized by the Kwame Ture, also known as Stokely Carmichael, which created what was called the Worldwide African uh, uh, Zionist <clears throat> Movement that was actually based in uh, Libya under the auspices of the Mataba. So we stand uh, consistently with the need to put a total end to the regime, the apartheid regime led by Netan, uh, Netan, Netan Yahoo. Netanyahu, forgive my Ebonics. <laughs> but, uh, but the reality, and I'm so, let me just digress for a second. Let me salute the African Peace Socialist Party for putting together this teaching because the propaganda machine across America is working 24 7, fooling and our people. And we have to begin to go out into the streets to re-educate our people because our people are falling, many of them are falling hook and sink to this mass propaganda that's been pushed, as I just said, 24 seven. So it's uh, also, I'd like to make an announcement too, that tomorrow for people in St. Louis, 
uh, the Palestinians, from what I understand, would be holding a rally at Kena Plaza at 4 p.m. And so I'm encouraging everyone, all of the progressive forces, to be in attendance. Also, uh, let's be clear that the United Nations Human Rights Commission that was formed in the early part of the 2000, I think 2006, has passed over 45 resolutions condemning the government of Israel for the human rights violations of the Palestinian people. Those 45 resolutions are double the number of resolutions against other countries of the entire globe. So obviously, this government, I always like to put it in simple terms, is a demon government. Let's just be clear. It is demon. And it's like vampires. And what do you do with a vampire? You put a stake in his heart. And that's what needs to be done, a stake in the heart of the government of Israel, the Zionist government, which is supported by this Zionist government too. <laughs> on the real side. And as Black people in this country, we need to put out a call that these billions and billions, probably up to trillions of dollars, that's going to Ukraine, yeah. that's going to Israel. Yes. Those should be our reparation dollars. Well. And that needs to be the call. And then with that as a rallying cry, <laughs> because we will be free. Yes. And one of the greatest contradictions has been exposed to what has just occurred, the tragic death of the thousands of people in Palestine that has been ongoing since the formation of the illegal government of Israel. Yeah. And one last thing, like my good brother, uh, Charles Barron, I've, I've been in that area. I've been in Israel, and I've seen first, I didn't get to Gaza, but in the cities in Jerusalem, it took me back to see the treatment of the Palestinian people there, took me back into history as far as the Jim Crowism of America. And when they talk about, and Biden is talking about the brutality that was visited upon uh, the Israeli population. Hell, has he ever spoke about the historic lynchings, the burnings of our people? Yeah. Yeah. So we have to point out those contradictions. And like my good brother Charles Byrne, I'm so excited because in my lifetime, yeah. our lifetime, we don't see a total change in world politics and the governance of different countries. Liberation in our lifetime. Liberation in our lifetime. Uhuru, Uhuru, thank you, uh, Brother Zaki Baroudi for that statement. And yes, liberation in, in our lifetime, we're gonna see um, a life that is worth living, that has a future and where all of our labor and, um, and our skills and our genius goes towards building a life that is, um, that is in our own interest. And so I just wanna salute you and appreciate you for that statement. Um, and that was uh, President General of the United, or sorry, of the Universal African Peoples Organization, also known as UAPO, uh, Zaki Baroudi. So thank you so much. Um, I want to welcome up next, um, you know, part of this fight back is the other, aspect of one thing that the African People's Socialist Party under the, the leadership of Chairman Amalia Chatella fought to resolve was the question of what to do about the white people, right? And, and um, here we are where uh, the, the Uhuru Three is represented, the, re the representative of, of the fight for the African working class in Chairman Amalia Chatella, but also Solidarity, who we heard from earlier, uh, Jesse Neville, who is the uh, chairperson of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And now we would like to hear from uh, Penny Hess, who is the chair of the African People's Solidarity Committee. And I just wanna um, salute you comrade and who is also the vice chair of the Hands Off for Who Fight Back and um, works under the leadership of the um, African People's Socialist Party, the organization of white people who um, 
are in the struggle for reparations. So thank you, Chairwoman Penny. I see you on Uhuru. Uhuru, Uhuru. Thank you, Chairman Wazy. And I want to salute this powerful event today. This is this is really historic. I want to salute my leadership, Chairman Omali Shatella, Deputy Chair Ona Zanea Shatella, and the African People's Socialist Party. And I, I want to, I also want to salute the profound presentation made by USM Chair Jesse Neville. That that was really, really powerful. And what I am very, very moved about today, first of all, is that that Chairman Omali Shatella has given us as Jesse said, the analysis to understand the world as it really is and to ena enable us to, for the first time in history, as the colonizers, to, to be able to jump off the pedestal upon which we sit on the backs of African people and not just be another, another self-appointed savior or Zionist or white leftist or just a parasitic white colonizer anymore, that we have the ability to join in a principled relationship to, to African and thereby to all oppressed and colonized peoples, the Palestinian people and all people struggling against this colonial mode of production on the various fronts that they're from. And you know, just I just want to salute and first of all, and really, really say what the fact that the chairman created the African People's Solidarity Committee, the organization of white people directly under the leadership of the party has changed the world. It is part of what is changing the world right now and understanding this colonial mode of production, this vicious this vicious reality that we all live in, as has been said, that we all have a relationship to, we as the colonizers facing African people and Palestinian people as the colonized, and that we also can play a role. There is a place for us, but we have to take responsibility for what white people have done and do and all of the Tulsas and the, you know, the, the, the burning of, of African cities and African human beings and the lynching and the terror and all that we have done every single day since this, this place was founded at the expense of African indigenous people with genocide being carried out by a popular, a popular stand, like the chairman called the white people's army the white people's army of just the regular white population that took upon ourselves to slaughter African and indigenous people so that we could steal their land and be, be the, the Zionists. The, the same relationship that Israel has modeled is based on what this United States is, is built on, genocide, terror, and colonialism. And I also want to I want to salute you, Chairman, because, because you have always, always put out the entire analysis of the question of Palestine in an anti-colonial way. And there was a time when people did not do that. You were the only one who did that, who stood there and said, Palestine is occupied illegitimate state by the illegitimate state of Israel and it, the land belongs to the Palestinian people, not just Gaza, not just the West Bank, not just parts of Jerusalem, the entire, what is called, what is called Israel belongs to the, the Palestinian people, just as this land, as you have always stood for that, that this land belongs to the indigenous people. And, you know, I, I remember, I just want to relate that the international solidarity between the African People's Socialist Party and the Palestinian people and all oppressed, the, the Nicaraguan people, all, all of the oppressed peoples of the planet, of China, of course, African people as one people, but, uh, you know, this has always been, you know, what you, what you fought for. 
And this is how I learned what international solidarity means and, and what it is from the stand of the party that there is no difference between Africans and Palestinians, between Africans and, and Filipinos, between Africans and indigenous. It is another front of the same struggle of which the African liberation movement has this incredibly wide embrace that takes everybody with them to, um, to fight and to win as one, not as isolated and has really given white people for the first time the ability to, to genuinely be part of that in a principled way and make our self-criticism by being organized under the leadership of the African revolution and fighting in the white community as we are directed strategically by the party to win reparations literally to African people. And, you know, I just wanted to convey that I remember, first of all, that the party resolution at the first party Congress, the very first resolution was the resolution in solidarity with the Palestinian people by the African revolution. And that was in 1981. Yeah. And that I remember an experience, I, I was, you know, talking to Maureen about it, Maureen, comrade Maureen out in California is, I think she was there too. But I had the honor of being at this incredible event held in San Francisco. I thought it was held at a labor hall or a, it was at a huge hall. Um, Maureen said it was maybe at San Francisco State University. Maybe, maybe that's where it was. Um, there was probably a thousand people there. It was vast majority. It was a, an event about the Palestinian struggle. And the uh, majority of the people were, were Arab and Palestinian from around the state of California. And the chairman got to speak. And of course it was so many speakers. So the chairman only got about like three to five minutes max to speak. He got up and in one sentence, in his first sentence, he put out such profound unity between African people in the US and around the world and the Palestinian people it was electrifying. And all of the all of the, the Arabs and the Palestinians started stamping their feet and cheering to, to the rooftops. The people united will never be defeated. Yeah. And the chairman couldn't even, I mean, you couldn't even speak. You couldn't even speak for probably five minutes then. And when you came down off the stage, I mean, they just mobbed you. And you know, and, and I, I have, you know, I've just seen what you have meant to the people on the planet Earth, to the Palestinian people, to so many other, you know, others who have said, you are our leader. And, you know, you are our leader. And just this understanding that, um, that the road to socialism is painted black. There is not, there is not another way to be a socialist except to be an opportunist and to be, you know, a white colonizer in a different face. And so I, you know, I'm just profoundly, this, this, this event today is profoundly moving and powerful. And I know that, Chairman, that you are responsible for so much of what the world understands about this today because you have fought for the colonial question when others are calling it apartheid, when others are calling it racism, you have fought for that analysis and brought it to the world. The colonial question, that's what we're seeing, you know, playing out in, in, in the West Bank and, you know, it, right on the ground there in the West Bank today, the colonial question is rearing its head, as you have said. And we do have the opportunity as white people, but we have to join we have to be organized under the leadership. We, it's not just something we can sit in a cafe and think about that we can be African internationalists and read right. the chairman and quote him. Right. We have to do the work. Yeah. All of the hundreds of years that white people 
have been lynching and killing and slaughtering African and other people. We have to go back in and win and win and win reparations, what is owed to African people, and win other white people to join in solidarity, to jump off this pedestal, to, to join the future of this planet, to, you know, to stand under the leadership of the African Revolution, which puts us in a principled relationship to all of the oppressed and colonized people on the planet Earth. So I just want to say unity through. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Penny. And yes, uh, just want to salute you and just what is happening in the chat here on Zoom, just a lot of unity and um, with what is being called in Karmat. And Helika says, no misguided guilt, but responsibility. And yes, we have a responsibility to the interests of the working class and, um, and in the and in the struggle for the African People's Socialist Party, it's the African working class who we understand carries the brunt of this um, of this vicious and vile social system, and we have a responsibility to um, to overturn it. So, comrades, we're going to move on to um, one last video that was able to make it in um, the uh, Malaya Movement USA. We want to appreciate those comrades. Um, who weren't able to make it, but who sent a video um, with solidarity. So I want to take a moment now and appreciate our engineer for pulling this up. This is Adin Tayag, who is the vice chairperson of Malaya Movement USA. And I want to um, give some time for us to hear their statement. Uhuru. Hello and gratitude to the African Union for Socialist Party and Hands Off Uhuru Coalition. We stand and move in solidarity with you all, especially as we fight to drop the charges against the Uhuru Three and help advance the Palestinian people's fight for freedom. My name is Adin Tayag, Vice Chair of the Malaya Movement USA, representing anti-fascist Filipinos across the United States. As Filipino Americans who have stood up against killings, brutal displacement, false imprisonment, and torture of everyday people, fighting for land and rights in the Philippines, Malaya Movement USA stands in solidarity with Palestinians who face the US-backed Israeli state's 75-year-long campaign to exterminate the Palestinian people. We stand in solidarity with those working towards a just and lasting peace in Palestine, which will only be achieved by solving the root cause of violence in the region, colonial occupation. The events that have happened since October 7 are a clear expression of the sheer will to fight for and defend the dignity and human rights of Palestinians who have long suffered under an oppressive occupation. Palestinians have been subjected to displacement and occupation for 75 years, and many of those who have resisted and fought for their right to land and livelihood in their own home have been imprisoned silenced and murdered. Israel has launched a complete siege of Gaza, cutting off the supply of electricity, food, water, and fuel to Palestinians on top of a 16-year blockade. We condemn Israel's indiscriminate military attacks and bombings in Gaza that have targeted densely populated residential areas, hospitals, UN schools, and shelters. As of this recording on October 13, at least 1,900 people have been killed in Gaza, including 640 children and thousands more wounded. This is Israel committing genocide. These attacks and punishment are war crimes and clear violations of international humanitarian law and must end immediately. We are also seeing a shocking increase in malicious disinformation meant to dehumanize Palestinians who've been imprisoned in Gaza for generations, all to justify unmitigated violence by the Israeli state. It's sickening and reminds us of the orchestrated and financed disinformation by the Philippine state to erase history and justify the violations of international humanitarian law committed by Philippine officials and armed forces. So we urge Filipinos to be vigilant about the facts and be in solidarity with Palestine. The Israeli government and weapons manufacturers are actually complicit in the rise of fascist dictatorship in the Philippines, being suppliers of weaponry, training, and intelligence to the oppressive Duterte and Marcos regimes. 
the Israeli government is culpable in the murder and disappearance of countless human rights defenders and civilians, not just in Palestine, but the Philippines. Both the Israeli Defense Forces and Armed Forces of the Philippines are perpetrators of indiscriminate attacks on civilians from aerial bombings to shellings, both violations of international humanitarian law. We condemn the United States government and Biden administration for its support of Israel and its annual $3.8 billion gift to Israel. As Malaya movement continues to push for the Philippine Human Rights Act, which aims to suspend security assistance until human rights violations cease and a thorough investigation is conducted. It's necessary that we continue to expose the United States bankrolling human rights violations by the armed forces of the Philippines and the Israeli Defense Forces. We unequivocally echo the call, stop arming Israel. We condemn the Marcos Duterte regime for its thoroughly dishonest expression of solidarity for Israel following the strike in Gaza against the Israeli occupation. The Marcos Duterte government condemned the attacks, quote, especially on civilian populations, unquote. Even as the Philippine security forces unblinkingly bomb, hamlet, displace, imprison, torture, and kill civilians, especially peasants and indigenous peoples residing on mining or plantation land with Israeli weapons, no less. Again, we urge Filipinos to be vigilant about the facts. It is our duty as Filipinos to firmly stand against fascism alongside our Palestinian siblings in their fight for survival, self-determination, and liberation. We call on Malaya Movement USA members to rise in solidarity and uphold our principles of defending and asserting human rights, democracy, and sovereignty from Palestine to the Philippines. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And from Palestine to the Philippines, stop the U.S. war machine. Uhuru. Yes, right on. Comrades, um, this has been a really powerful teaching, and I just want to uh, really appreciate that segment of today's program where we got to hear from those who stand in solidarity with the anti-colonial struggle and that are committed to helping to build this anti-colonial free speech movement. So I want to appreciate um, and salute um, Aldeen for, for that uh, solidarity statement and uh, appreciate Malaya Movement uh, USA for joining us um, virtually on today. So we are um, you know at a very exciting part in our program because pretty soon we're going to announce um, you know, where we, how much the people have been able to help us support, raise, and um, fund this drive for the legal defense for this uh, fight back against the colonial state and all the other ways in which we have to raise this, uh, wage this fight back. But we are moving into Q&A, and I didn't, um, I, I want to say that I want to appreciate Director Akile, who is off to another task right now, who is um, not emceeing or co emceeing with me, but I just wanted to salute her profound leadership um, in this fight back. And on behalf of Director Akile, I do want to remind people that if you have not already gotten your issue of the November uh, burning spear, you should find um, someone in your area who is distributing the spear. And if you don't have somebody, it should be you who distributes the burning spear. Um, you can do this by going to the burning spear dot, uh, dot store, the burning spear dot, dot store, and our chat moderators can put that in the chat. This is um, a way for us to continue to have these kind of discussions. This uh, uh, this newspaper has has um, is a proof is lasting example of the relentlessness of the African People's Socialist Party to be able to put the um, the objective truth in the front um, in, in front of the people and to and to say that you know we are not um, we're not dumb you know we understand what's happening and even if we don't we know something's wrong and to be able to have um, a a like our own apparatus how we can sum up what is happening in the world is so important i just want to salute um, the long you know long live the burning spear newspaper and let's keep this paper alive and let's and you know you can write you can volunteer and i want to appreciate those who are already doing that so i just wanted to say that um, because this is where we're going to continue to have and find this analysis where we won't find anywhere else. So we have one uh, one question that was selected, you know, that came in early and that might be helpful for us to uh, touch on. Uh, we have to kind of shorten some aspects of our program. So um, I do want to pose this question. 
and um, let those who are on know, such as the chairman. Um, we also have uh, Lisa and Benjamin and those you know who else who have stayed with us. We want to be able to sum up this question. So this question came from Mike Reeves, and um, what he says here is, what do you think about the possibility that this thing was set up to try to prevent the emergence of an anti-colonial system as is being led by the BRICS? Um, Netanyahu covertly backed Hamas for years to weaken the Palestinian Authority when they were ready to make peace with um, Rabin. This attack was now set up, sorry, this attack has now set up Gaza for destruction and could prevent Iran and Saudi Arabia from joining the BRICS with a new war thoughts this he's asking what are you know what are our thoughts and why not a ceasefire and a two-state solution if that could prevent more needles or, or more needless bloodshed so i um if you need access to that panelist i can find a way to get that to you if you lost that earlier on in the chat but um i and I want to open this up for anybody who else, um, you know, who would like to come on and to address this question. But, um, you know, one of the things that has been pretty clear throughout this particular um, program is the is the anti-colonial question. And we understand that everything, even BRICS, all of these um, functions and ways in which we try to solve the problems of imperialism and colonialism rest upon the economic base, um, which is which is which is the attack on Africa. And so this superstructure, you know, even we can sum up BRICS as operating on this superstructure while it is posing a serious threat and is a contending power to the colonial state. And so, and so I don't, you know, I I, I would obviously leave this to the chairman to even help deepen this question. And he has um, you know, you know, multiple times, but I do want to just really appreciate the clarity that has been brought throughout this process of this teaching about the uh, the dialectic of the colonized and the colonizer and 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 how we are um, building and fighting to turn the world right side up as the chairman has um, has said before. So, oh, I see you on here, chairman. Did you want to speak to that? I will. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that. Uh, it's really interesting that uh, almost uh, every time um, a real meaningful uh, and critical assault is being made against what's supposed to be the most powerful, uh, far-seeing, uh, all-knowing uh, entity, state apparatus, uh, the disbelief by some people that the oppressed could actually do this uh, and makes it necessary for uh, sometimes people come up with extraordinary explanations. I, I watched somebody on a video uh, uh, to yesterday uh, talking about how it was all set up and they were let in and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with, Ham you know, with Hamas. So I don't know if the, if this, uh, the uh, intelligence apparatus of, of, uh, of uh, the Israeli state uh, has ever uh, had a relationship with Hamas or not. Um, I can see how they would see it in their strategic interest. Uh, uh, in fact, I, I, I know that there have been occasions uh, uh, when things like that have happened. Even the United States government uh, and the president, um, uh, Brzezinski and uh, 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 James Earl Carter, uh, you know, worked to uh, empower the jihad uh, and to, to attack Afghanistan the rest of that, but the point is that even if they, if if that happened, uh, it it has certainly backfired on them. I've known of instances where colonized people have assumed that somehow they can come into some kind of relationship with a sector of the colonial powers to uh, to achieve uh, their their aims, uh, uh, etc. And most instances that their aims are not achieved. But uh, I don't know uh, if anything like that has ever. What, what uh, extent, if any, uh, this happened with the settler state of Israel. But what I do know is that uh, if, if, in fact, the settler state uh, played a role in this, it was a horrible mistake. Uh, and and uh, because the, the, the issue is always more than uh, just the, uh, uh, the physical defeat uh, of the oppressor. Uh, one of the most incredible things that the thing that troubles them more than anything else is the example of an success uh, against the oppressor. So if, in fact, the Israelis helped the peoples of the world uh, to believe uh, 
that an impoverished, besieged, uh, starved population uh, under the worst circumstances, under the greatest security apparatus uh, in the world, uh, could come together and uh, and 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 uh, come into uh, uh, that and into uh, Israel uh, with this uh, uh, offensive. Uh, if the if the settler state did that. It certainly uh, did something that would uh, excite and mobilize and inspire uh, oppressed peoples all around the world. So that would be an instance of picking up a big rock and dropping it on, the on their feet. Uh, I don't believe they did that. Uh, uh, I think that the people, uh, uh, people's will to struggle and, and defeat our oppressor is always there. And I've seen instances uh, where in my life, uh, uh, and on, in, this, in this colony uh, within, uh, this United States of North America, I've seen uh, the colonized African population take on this security apparatus with a tremendous amount of success. And I've known it to happen in Vietnamese, other people. The, the colonizer always has uh, the advantage in terms of technology and resources, et cetera, et cetera. And the colonized have always had to overcome that in order to, to defeat them, in order to gain anything that approximates freedom. So I believe that the Palestinian people want to be free, and I believe uh, that uh, that they've done uh, incredible things to uh, to make that manifest. And also, I know this is not the first time that the Palestinians have surprised and shocked them and other peoples around the world. That's what oppressed peoples do. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. Uh, very, very helpful to help clarify and just you know again. Palestinian people want to be free, African people want to be free. And even uh, here we are just, you know, again, talking about the attack on freedom of speech and just even saying it um, is enough of a threat. And so I want to also appreciate um, the rest of our panelists who have joined us here today. And I just want to join in um, really saluting um, all of the guests that were here and unable to make it. I want to salute and appreciate uh, Jesse Neville, who is the chair of the Afri uh, of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. I want to appreciate, obviously, uh, Chairman Amalia Shatella, who just helped us to deepen the analysis of where we are um, in this period in the world. I want to thank uh, Professor Ward Churchill, uh, who is an expert and done lots of research on, on COINTELPRO, which, as we see, this attack is still happening today and spoke to the uh, to the conditions around settler colonialism here, as well as uh, Compa Benjamin Prado of Union del Barrio. I want to thank Councilman Charles Barron uh, of, of the city of New York. And I also want to appreciate Alizé with the um, Anagbayan, who is a so solidarity officer with Anagbayan San Diego, and Saki Baruti, the uh, President General of the Universal People's African organization or a universal African people's organization, Uhuru, as well as Penny Hess, the chair of the African People's Solidarity Committee and our statement from Aldine Tayag, who is the vice chair of Malaya Movement USA. So such a powerful program today, comrades. And um, I don't, you know, for the sake of time, that's the only question that we're going to be able to take for today. But as the chairman said, we need to continue to do this. Uh, find a community, find somebody's living room, bring the teaching to the people. Um, this is the only way that we're going to continue to practice. We have to practice what it's like to be able to um, win this fight back. And we're going to take this to November 4th. We're going to meet on the ground. We're going to see each other for the first time. And I'm just very excited, comrades. And I think uh, that there is no time than the present for us to make this happen in our lifetime. So I'm going to pull up our fundraising uh, committee. Comrade Amanda, who is also the vice chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, and who was also one of the uh, Uhuru members who was under attack on that day on July 29th. We're going to get a quick update from the appeal or to see how we did on our resources and raising for today, but I just want to already salute and, you know, all the people who went to handsoffuhuru.org slash donate to make it, make it happen. So here comes comrade Amanda. Um, thank you, comrade. I'm going to turn it over to you. Uhuru. 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 Thank you, Chair Moise. Um, as was said, my name is Amanda and I'm the vice chair of the fundraising committee for the Hands Off Uhuru. And I have the honor of also being a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And we work under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, winning reparations from the white community. I want to express my sincere unity with the analysis that has been put out in this teaching, um, in particular that of Chairman Omalia Shatella, 
And I want to salute the leadership of the chairman, Chair Moisey, and everybody that spoke today for this teaching. We salute the resistance of the Palestinian people, and we say hands off Uhuru, hands off Africa, victory to the Palestinian people. So the fundraising committee, we can go to the next slide, um, wants to thank the thousands of you who have contributed over $245,000 since the FBI attacks last year. So Thanks to all of your support, this committee has been able to secure lawyers and other needs for this campaign and has been able to continue the pushback against the brutal US government oppression against the Black Liberation Movement. Thanks to your support, the Uhuru 3 legal team filed a powerful motion for dismissal of the indictment. We can go to the next slide again, um, which led to a hearing in Tampa where arguments were presented by the Uhuru 3 lawyers and the prosecutors before a federal magistrate judge. So any day now, the judge ruling can come down, deciding whether the bogus charges will be dismissed outright or will proceed to trial to a tentative date set for next year. But we are clear that no matter what the outcome of the judge's ruling, the war is not over and the struggle continues. So whether it's preparing for trial or for civil litigation against the federal government or both, the counteroffensive as expressed in the legal arena, um, arena has just begun. So funds are still urgently needed and we are just $32,000 away from completing this first phase of our campaign. Um, and we can go to the next slide. So our goal for this meeting was to raise $500, but I am excited to announce that we have actually already raised $755. And I just wanna appreciate those that have joined us so far. We have Karpani who gave 20, MQ that gave 15, Leah gave 200, Batum gave 20, Onazne Yashitala gave 100, who in the room with us here, Kat Turner gave 30, Sam Jackson gave 50, Becky Camo gave 20, Quaker gave 50, Angelica pledged 100, Randy Lore gave 20, and then Kitty in the room with us as well gave 30. Um, so that brings us up to that amount. So you can go to handsoffuhru.org slash donate. And I am confident that we can actually double our goal today. We are right. only $245 away from that. So people are welcome to match. Um, anyone that gave $100, you can also match Leah, who gave $200 to get us even closer. We have someone in the room here. 50. And we have 50 from Jesse Neville, or her, her <laughs> Jesse. So that brings us to 805. And I'm just going to, if you forgive me, peek at the website and see if anything else has come in. 25 from Penny Hess or who Penny Hess in the room with us as well. Um, yeah, so, you know, we want to really encourage people to go to handsoffwhoorg slash donates. Um, you can go to the next slide as well. Another way you can contribute is by becoming a sustainer of the Hands Off Who campaign. Being a sustainer means that every single month you are giving a certain amount of money to this campaign. It's something that we can count on to come in. We can use it to budget for monthly expenses. It's very significant. And maybe you want to give $1,000, but you can't do that all at once. Well, you can give $100 a month and you will actually give more than $1,000 over the course of a year. So that's one way you can contribute. And then you also can become a member of the Hands Off Uhuru Coalition, which is either $10 for an individual person to join or $25 for an organization. Um, so all of that is very significant in contributing to this goal. Um, and just one thing I wanted to add that you know, while the Palestinian people are fighting back, the colonial governments of US and Europe are escalating their attacks on the rights of colonized people to freedom of speech. The government of Germany has declared the Sam Samadun illegal, um, which is a Palestinian prisoner organization um, that's also part of the Hands Off Who coalition. The government of France has outlawed all pro-Palestinian demonstrations. And it makes it even more urgent that we do everything we can to donate to this legal defense fund, which is fighting for victory, for free speech for African people, which will signal victory to all oppressed people fighting for free speech all over the world. So you can fund the fight back today, during today, and defend the anti-colonial free speech movement. I'm just gonna look one last time on the website to see if we have any other donations um, or from anybody else in the room as well. And after I am off the, screen you can also continue to go to handsoffwhoorg slash donate Uhuru. 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 
Uhuru, Uhuru, Comrade Amanda, wow. Um, you know, I just wanna salute the people, honestly, because like you said, we are inches away from just doubling our goal. And this just speaks to how, um, you know, just how serious we are and, and you know, we're not playing around. And I wanna um, go ahead and make a $5 donation for today. Um, that's my pledge and I'll take place that, that I will do after this, um, after this webinar. So if anyone wants to match me, go ahead and just let us know five on five on five and that you got five on it. So comrades, we are moving towards the end of our program and I am very excited to wrap us up with, uh, my comrade, Vice Chair Lisa Davis, who is Vice Chair of the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace and Reparations. You know, I've been sitting patiently waiting to just yell, Uhuru. Uh, Vice Chair Lisa, it's, it's, um, it's time for the 15th Annual Black People's March on the White House. Yes, November 4th. And, yes, November 4th. And I want to just uh, say that it was a pleasure to meet you the last year when I went, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again this year, comrade. And um, I'm going to just, you know, remind everybody that the reason that we are here, um, Black is Back and Hands Off for Who is because the Hands Off for Who Fight Back Coalition is co-sponsoring this year's 15th Annual March on the White House. And uh, Sister Lisa Davis and I are going to take us through a quick update on, um, on where we are and where you need to be in order to make sure that, that you can get there on the ground. Yes, and it so, must be successful. We want it to be more powerful than it's ever been before. We need people there on the ground in D.C. November 4th. Uhuru, uhuru, comrade. So here's some pictures of us last year on November 4th, um, starting at Malcolm X Park, and then as we will march to Lafayette Park. So, uh, you know, if you want to volunteer and if you, you know, were there last year and you want to get more involved, this is the part of the segment of today's program where you will let us know so we can make it happen. And I want to acknowledge, which um, I don't know if this was announced, but another uh, donation, $10 from MQ. So Uhuru MQ helping us take it forward to November 4th. <clears throat> So Comrade Lisa, why don't we tell the people where we're gonna, where these mobilizations are gonna be taking place, Uhuru. Yes, we are gonna have uh, mobiliz mobilizations definitely taking place in Washington, D.C., starting with Malcolm X Park, and then we're going to be marching to that house of ill repute, the White House. Um, Los Angeles, California. Comrades are organizing on the West Coast in Los Angeles, in London, you know, the UK, Pretoria, South Africa, occupied Azania, um, demonstrations and, and uh, protests of support will be taking place. And also, let me just say this, if you all are someplace you, and you want to organize something, you can organize in your region as well. Yes, right let on. Let us know about it. That's really important. Yes, this is, um, you know, let us know. You can email us at info at blackisbackcoalition.org. Uh, you can email uh, info at handsoffwhohoo.org. We'll make sure that we help you get what you need to make it happen. Um, and I do want to, and I would be remiss if I did not mention that in uh, Venezuela, um, you know, comrades there as well are holding, you know, symbolic representations and stance of solidarity for November 4th. So we are taking this um, to all corners of the, um, of the globe. Uh, so, you know, speaking of the West Coast mobilization, we wanted to put this out that uh, to remind people the chairman was just here on it. Well, the, uh, the Uhuru three were just here in the West Coast for a tour. And we uh, want to remind the people about the West Coast Regional Action on November 4th. This is happening in Los Angeles, California. APSC Chair Penny Hess will be there. One of the Uhuru three will be on the ground marching with us on the West Coast. So again, uh, this is... The information that you can, if you want more information about this, you can go to uh, blackpeoplesmarch.com or handsoffuhuru.org for more information. Uhuru. And uh, outreach materials, if you need to print, and we're gonna have, th this will be updated soon, you know, so that people can also share on social media and in many other ways, you can share this information with the world. But we want you to download the outreach the outreach material. You can go to hands off, or sorry, blackpeoplesmarch.com slash outreach, and you can print, uh, and download flyers. Yes, and pass them, pass them out in your neighborhood. You can also download posters, put yes. the posters up in your neighborhood. We just, we want to let the colonizers know we are fighting back. We've never stopped. 
All right, transportation, go ahead, comrade. Yeah, so this is where people can go to check out what's currently going on in their area. We are we are organizing our buses to come to DC buses and bands. So uh, you can go to this section on the website. Uh, we have uh, people that are organizing from Chicago, Illinois, the Newark, New Jersey, New York area. I know I saw some New York and New Jersey folks on this chat. Get on the bus, get on that bus. Philadelphia PA people will be organizing are organizing a bus from St. Louis, Missouri, and currently St. Petersburg, Florida. And again, get on the bus. And you can just click on those links and it'll tell you how to get in touch with the people in that area who are organizing. Right on, yes. So you can go to hands off or to blackpeoplesmarch.com and you'll see the link for transportation where you can directly go and fill out that form, tinyurl.com slash G-O-T-B, which is get on the bus 2023. Yes. Girl. Thank you, comrade. And uh, so, yeah, how do we register? Where do we go? As we said before, blackpeoplesmarch.com. And uh, comrade Lisa Davis, if you want to just talk about endorse, like um, how can people endorse? Yes, people can go uh, click on the link and the link will tell you how you can endorse. Um, you can endorse as an organization, endorse as an individual. It is so important that we get as many endorses as we can. Also, please make sure that you're following the Black is Back Coalition social media pages and also the Hands Off Uhuru social media pages because we are going to be pumping out so much information. We have a presence on TikTok, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram and, you know, Facebook. And, you know, we just want to uh, utilize every avenue that we have to put the information out there. And most importantly, um, to reach out to our people and to organize, to organize against this uh, vicious, ruthless um, uh, colonizing machine. We must fight back and organize against this. In the Black is Back Coalition, we stand with all oppressed people of the world. And I just invite people to also please go to the Black is Back Coalition.org and look at our look at our um our demands and look at our 19 point platform. You'll see that point number 18 is uh free Palestine. We take an international view among about what is going on in this world. We say hands off Africa, hands off Haiti, you know, colonizers go home and uh, we will be free. Uhuru. Uhuru. And so, yes, comrades, let us know you're coming. Let us know, make it real. Go to blackpeoplesmarch.com and uh, register. Click on the register now button. You see the countdown. We are 20 days away um, from this um, from this historic march. Put it in the chat. Tell us that you will be marching on November 4th, whether you're marching in on the West or the East Coast or in, or in Europe or in Africa or any other place in the world, let us know. And um, so again, comrades, we just want to, um, be, before we go to announcements and move to close, make one last push that um, you know we need this Black People's March. We see the situation that's happening in the world. Let's build the anti-colonial free speech movement. We got to get on the ground, comrades. Let them feel our presence. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru, comrade. Now, one step backwards, forward ever. All power to the people. Power to the people. Hey, Black power to the African nation. Uhuru. Yes. Thank you, Sister Lisa. Thank you, Uhuru. Uhuru, comrade. So I'm going to just take us through to announcements and then turn it over to the chairman with any closing remarks. We want to appreciate everybody for staying with us for just a little longer, um, um, but it's been a really powerful um, program. And I know Vice Chair Penny, if you also wanted to join me on this section, feel free, but I'm just gonna quickly give announcements about the coalition uh, that our next meeting uh, will be on Monday, October 23rd at 7 p.m. Uh, this will be another open meeting and we invite everybody to come and just you know, any last minute questions and things that we need to resolve before we march uh, the following week. We want to let, um, let everybody know that uh, the court transcripts are in. Um, and just to give an update that the court hearing for the oral arguments on the Uhuru three, as you summed up, as we summed up earlier, went um, fabulous and went, you know, because the people showed up and we let the state know that they that that, you know, they are not doing this in in isolation or or behind closed doors and that the room was packed 
Some people couldn't even get into the room. And that right there is the, um, is the, is the fire that is building in this campaign, in this fight back, in this building, this anti-colonial free speech movement. So we want to salute our attorneys and remind people to continue to check handsoffforhood.org for more updates about the court hearing. Um, and, uh, and as we know, we are preparing to put the state on trial, you know, should they take it there. So uh, there will be a press conference for those of you who are coming to, to Washington, D.C. on Friday, November 3rd at 12 p.m. Eastern at Sankofa Bookstore. There will be a press conference, and we want to um, invite everybody to register. That way you can get information about this press conference and be on the list, on the invitation list with more details. Uh, last announcement is that Project Black Ankh, which is a uh, the African nation's uh, global response to our Red Cross. So this is this is the black the black version of the Red Cross. This is uh, led by the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project. If you're on the ground in St. Louis tomorrow Sunday, uh, they are having a one hour free uh, compression and CPR AED education class. And uh, we want to say that if you have any questions, you can call this number 314-380-8016. And I'll put that in the chat. This is how you can get more information about this free education class. And thank you so much, uh, chat moderator Chiwo, who put that in the chat for us right away. So please register. And you can also scan that QR code. But comrades, we want to just say in unconditional solidarity with the struggle of the um, Palestinian people, we want to say free, free Palestine, long live Palestine, mm -hmm. victory to the Palestinian people, and let's build the anti-colonial free speech movement, and long live Chairman Omali Eshetela. So Uhuru, comrades, Chairman, um, any closing words before we close out? Uhuru. <clears throat> Uh, comrade, I just want to express appreciation to everyone who's come on to this incredibly significant teaching and to also remind everybody of the significance of the November 4th mobilization. It is historic and it is uh, our greatest wish that, uh, uh, that, uh, that the unity that we've seen reflected here in terms of the Hands Off Uhuru uh, committee that has been built in terms of the July eighth uh, uh, con conference that we had to consolidate the <clears throat> anti-colonial free speech movement, it's going to be really important to see that reflected uh, in the turnout and people coming from all the various places and from, uh, and from all the political uh, locations that you uh, occupy uh, to November 4th, whether that's in Washington, D.C., whether that's in Pretoria, South Africa, whether that's in, in Los Angeles, California, uh, whether that's uh, in London, uh, where people from Europe are being called to participate in a demonstration at the United States Embassy. So uh, it's, it's a critical moment in history where the various contradictions uh, are, 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 are coalescing, coming together, uh, and, and the opportunity to uh, make a great leap forward uh, in this struggle is here, is upon us. This is, uh, uh, we believe, uh, the major uh, uh, factor in, in tilting uh, uh, in a permanent kind of way, this uh, uneasy equilibrium that has that the world has been locked in for a while the, between the past and the future, the past of colonial terror, uh, domination of the peoples and the future of liberation. Progress is on the side of the colonists, and we, call, we really think this is important. And what's going to be a major breakthrough is the participation in so many people uh, from the settler population, that is to say, white leftists and, and socialists and communists and, and, and various other activists you know, to really be able to unite uh, in this process. Nothing like this has ever happened where the colonizers have been able to call on a mobilization centering the colonial question in a way that uh, magnifies or certainly clarifies reality that the whole rotten social system rests upon the backs of the enslaved, the colonially enslaved people who've been living under the worst kind of domination for hundreds of years. So that's going to be a critical development to see uh, 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 the white people able to join with us. And I think it's also appropriate to, to make this point again because of the, uh, the ideological uh, uh, distortion of reality that we've seen coming around this question of Israel is that uh, this that we are talking about is something that offers freedom and liberation for the Jewish people. Uh, because what it does is opens a door uh, for Jewish people to join with the rest of the peoples around the world to abandon your bourgeoisie, 
abandon your bourgeoisie, which is connected with the colonial uh, uh, project to oppress the peoples of the world. Uh, 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 this is the salvation of Jews as well as, as it is for other peoples. The, the colonial question is something that's exploding and the contradiction is making itself evident uh, every day. And especially that is true uh, on occupied Palestinian land. So we think that's important. And, 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 and I feel confident in being able to say this uh, uh, and because of the attempt that's often made to misconstrue uh, the opposition to Palestine as some kind of opposition to Jews. That's your bourgeoisie that's told you that. Right. That's the bourgeoisie that's locked you into a, a relationship that's supposed to the rest of the peoples of the world. I criticize the state of Palestine. I criticize the Jewish bourgeoisie, just like I criticize the African petty bourgeoisie, just like I can criticize Barack Hussein Obama for the role that he plays, uh, just like I can criticize Lord Austin, the guy who heads up the US uh, Pentagon, just like I can criticize the four-star uh, general um, uh, Marine who has been made a four-star general for the purpose of putting him in charge of Africa. I can criticize them. If I can criticize the Africans, if I can criticize these African neocolonial forces, white power uh, in blackface dominating African people around the world and where I'm located right now, I damn sure can criticize the bourgeoisie, the Jewish bourgeoisie. And um, I'm calling on you to have the integrity to do that, to abandon, do not stake your future on the future of the bourgeoisie, whether it's Jewish, whether whatever the hell, German or whatever the hell it is, does the bourgeoisie is sinking and it'll drag you down with it if, if you're not careful. So we, we're talking about a movement that liberates humanity, not there to oppress Jews or anything else. And the only reason that one can think that is the same reason somebody comes up to us and say, when we say black power, they say, what about the white people? The point is, unless you stand on the backs of black people, black power doesn't mean a threat to you. It offers you an opportunity for liberation as well. So I wanted to say that people look for the mystery around the Tel Offensive. I was just talking to a dear comrade, uh, uh, I think my wife, uh, a day or two ago, and why would, why would they do this now? That was the question. And, uh, the, and, and of course, we've seen the, the thing that's being raised, and I say they, I'm talking about the Palestinians. And we've seen the questions about uh, how, how uh, somehow uh, they had to be let in, or somehow the Iranians must have had something to do with it. I tell you what informed them. I tell you what informed them. Tet, yes. the Vietnamese Tet offensive informed them, and so a lot of Palestinians will die, are dying as a consequence. Of just like with Tet, in terms of Tet offensive in Vietnam, a lot of Vietnamese people died. They attacked, but they were supposed to already have been dead. Uh, according to U.S. bourgeoisie, they, it was over, the war was over, and then when Tet happened and hit them everywhere, despite the fact that Vietnamese bodies were all over the place, it demoralized, uh, crushed the, mor the, the morale of the American population and made it necessary for them to get the hell out of Vietnam. I know that we've seen this cruel uh, unity, uh, parent, outspoken unity articulated about killing Palestinians or what have you coming uh, from most of the media. And I'm sure that a lot of that happened in occupied Palestine as well uh, from the Zionist uh, uh, organizations. But I guarantee you that something has happened uh, with that population, that settler population, that this, this, they, they now have to pay attention like they never had to pay attention before uh, to the, the fact is that this, this state is going to go down. They saw that. They had to be, the, 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 and it makes it necessary for them to have to question why they are there. As long as an oppressor doesn't have to ask a question about why they are there, uh, they will continue to occupy that. So something has happened. Tet Offensive, I'm sure, is what, 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 what contributed to uh, the, uh, 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 what happened with, the, uh, with Hamas's uh, uh, massive breakout uh, uh, on October 7th. So, uh, and so we just wanna call on everybody uh, to come out uh, for November 4th. Brothers and sisters and comrades everywhere, November 4th, let's get there. We're not gonna get the Democratic Party money from their labor unions and other stuff to get us buses. We're gonna have to 
scramble ourselves, use our, all of our resources and believe enough in what it is that we are doing that we will make whatever necessary uh, sacrifices to get to Washington, D.C., to get to L.A., to get to Pretoria, to get to the U.S. Embassy in London on November 4th. All power to the people, Black power to the African nation. Adelante siempre, forward ever, backwards never. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Chairman, uh -huh, comrades, um, uh -huh. want to make the last announcement, 970 ways on today, forward ever, backwards never, comrades, Uhuru. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Bye.